You would have thought someone would want a goal scoring goal, he would. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever we sign a new player, we say, right, now you've got to go and sit in a room with Jimmy for three hours, he's going to talk you through his goal. <laughs> Toughness as a goalie really comes from dropping a cross, conceding a goal, and coming for the next cross. You know, and you just literally sign two and a half year deal at a club, and you, you just found out the manager hates goalkeepers. <laughs> I took my gloves off, took my boots off. I just threw him in the middle. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm done. I said, I'm, I'm fucking done with you. And he went, you what? I said, I'm done with you. I said, I fucking don't even like you. I literally turned, put my hand up, and then got absolutely smacked from all the players from different angles and, and jumped on. <laughs> I didn't fulfil my potential at all as a goalie. You know, let's get, let's, let's, let's get the elephant. I scored a goal for Carlisle, <laughs> but, you know, which was great. But that wasn't uh, the career I probably should have had. Gentlemen, how are we doing? Very well, thank you. All right, all right you coshers are all right out there? Coshers? Coshers. Yeah, we're going coshers today. <laughs> you coshers? <laughs> what the fuck? All part of the clan. <laughs> how are we doing? Big family, aren't we? Yeah, all one big family. Especially you Patreons. <laughs> um, what a creep. And a wink as well. <laughs> what an animal. Jimmy Full of God. confidence, aren't you? Yeah, well, I, I will be after my game on Sunday, won't I? Yeah. We well. don't know what's gone yet. No. I'm predicting at least three. What goals? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm tipping an hamstring. Yeah, I am. Or a calf. Going on your track record. Although, if I get a good one early doors, I'm straight off. Yeah? Just walk off. Because you are very injury prone, aren't yeah. you? What, go, finish on a high. <laughs> Just give it that one after it. It's nestling in. in onion, onion bag. bag. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, man. We'd have played by the time this has gone out, so. Yeah, yeah we, we'll, we'll be stiff. So we'll, we'll get a full review of the game during the next <laughs> yeah. intro. Yeah. We're going to have to get some footage. We're going to have to get Matty. I know he's playing and probably captain, but we're going to have to get some footage of him. Yeah, get David down to do some. Yeah. We hope everybody's well. Jimmy Glass this week. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, infamous Jimmy Glass. Yes. I mean, some infamous. again. Why is he infamous? For his goal. Oh, is infamous not a bad? Yeah, it's... Is it? Yeah, for being a bit... Like, you're famous for doing not good things. Oh, sorry. Uh, apologies, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Jimmy. <laughs> the famous... I, mean, I don't know if he's been up to other stuff. Like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, I always sneeze when the I get famous. nervous. Famous. <laughs> the famous Jimmy Glass. Yes. Infamous. Yeah. yeah, you're probably right. Yeah. Famous Jimmy Glass. I mean, Glass. Some, some listeners, viewers might... Some not younger aware, ones. Again, not aware of... Uh, the triumphs of Jimmy mm. Glass. Just looking at the footage, it looks like it was in the fucking 60s, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah. Never Was it 99? 2000 or something? Oh, not too good. 99, <laughs> well, too. You look at the strips and the cameras and that. Yeah, yeah. Before HD, weren't it? Definitely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for those who don't know, it was, well, it was the dying seconds while playing for Carlisle. It was the whole to... thing, though, wasn't it? Only going for the three games. Up. Yeah. Carlisle going to slip out of the league. And probably... Go under, weren't yeah. They? The chairman they were the was where they were going to go under. Scumfork game had finished, four minutes left, and the guy comes on the tan. Oh, you've got four minutes to save our football club, yeah. which is against, I think, all FA rulings for uh, stadium announcers. Even back then, yeah. don't don't tell them what happened next. So there's no point in watching no. the episode. <laughs> <laughs> Leave I mean, them on a cliff find out. Cliff edge. <laughs> it's like telling somebody what didn't. Don't, don't tell him what happens in Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't spoil it for him. <laughs> Good film. What don't, happened? He's not seen it. No. Don't, don't spoil it. But, um, yeah, no, it's going to be, it's a good one. I think it's a good one. To be fair, yeah, we, I do like them. we do say they're all good ones, don't yeah. we? Yeah. We've never quite said, to be fair, it's, all, it's a bang average out We there, record but. loads, don't we? You don't put them out because of shit. Yeah. It's only the, the cream the comes cream to the get some rise. To the yes, top. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, no. what we, we need to here? mention uh, our sponsors for this week's episode, Why Food. <laughs> It's that noise. Ooh, ooh. I don't know, as if we can see just, it coming. Like. He's only just noticed them. <laughs> oh, <laughs> me why? There seems to be we six. There seems to be six bottles well, on just us. It's just kicked him, woke me up. <laughs> um, well, we all know some of us, busy lives on the road, you know, and sometimes you've not, you you, you know, John, because you're always saying you've got eat. a mental week on. And sometimes you've not got time to, to get a full, healthy, nutritious meal in your well with Y Foods. They've, they've sorted that out for you. Because so they replacements. Yeah, they replacements. They've basically created a complete ready to drink meal. And it contains all the nutritional goodness that you need for a healthy a healthy replacement there's, meal. There's the, the key word. It is. 
healthy. It is, and that will keep you full. Well, you might need two, John, but it'll keep <laughs> you full for three to five hours. The nice, that's the one I had. Strawberry, oh, strawberry. One. lovely. Yeah, oh, look at these flavors: vanilla. They've got classic chocolate, crazy coconut, happy banana, oh, salted caramel, heavenly hazelnut. There's many more as well, and they do a ve- vegan range. Cut to the chase, Chrissy. Have we got an offer? Have we got an offer? Yes, we have. Kosh 10 gets you 10% off. The link's in the description on both the audio and the video, so just click away and you get your 10% off with your code Kosh 10. Them live show tickets are on sale now for everybody who fancies it. Middlesbrough, Leeds, Bradford, London. I'm doing this off memory. Manchester. Have I missed anything? I think that's it, Chris. Yeah. I've done well, that. I'm just yeah. looking at all this nutritional value here. This, we've got some uh, cracking guests lined up, a bit of music as well. Yes. It's going to be good. Then we're off to the uh, Sheffield Wednesday Sunderland game. So there will be a video out whenever this goes out. Well, <laughs> we should have spoke that's a week ago. <laughs> <laughs> we should have spoken about this in the last, maybe yeah, even the one before last. We're, not, we're obviously not all on the ball, <laughs> are we? I have been on the hunt for new guests, though, and I've been trying to go. I've been trying to cross the Atlantic and see what we can get from some of those those fo- foreign wonders that we've we've had playing in England in the past. What uh, I will say about you, you're very proactive on that yeah. front, Chrissy. Yeah. Just a random message to somebody that we've never really heard of. But it's proactive, but it don't get many results. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, probably, well, not even probably, definitely, we know the reason why. Do you want me to read it out? Have you got it there? I'm trying to find it now. Right. Yeah, the- there you go. So is it, can we paint the can, paint, paint the, the picture? Yeah, yeah. Picture. I mean, one, one of my favourite players, Bolton. Bolton legend. Obviously, we've got a, a massive, massive Bolton fan on here. Massive. So uh, you thought to yourself, I'm going to get in touch with the next Bolton player. We've, we've talked about him a few times. There's yeah. been a few tales. Nicky Hunt, I think. Hi Sig, spelt S I G. Hope you and the family are well. I'm getting in touch from Under the Cosh. We are the biggest football interview podcast in the UK. Don't read that bit. Don't. Skip that bit. Yeah, skip that no, bit. No, no, I think it's important because <laughs> that's a lie in itself. <laughs> <laughs> You've We've got had to a... sell the dream, haven't you? You've got to, you know. 100%, I'm, I'm with you. I'm We've trying had... to get him fly over from Denmark. We've had a number of your ex-teammates on in the past and we'd love to have you as a guest to discuss your story slash career if you'd be interested. Now, I don't know if you picked up on it early doors. Hi, Sig. <laughs> S-I-G. I'm snotting here. <laughs> Hi. You see, you see past that, don't you, somebody? Hi, Sig. S-I-G. Sig of the dump. So this is the reply from Stig Tofting. No, thanks. You can't even spell my name. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't put your name under your writing. Wink emoji. So basically, you've messaged one of your heroes, you've misspelled his name, it. you've lied to him about has been the biggest football <laughs> podcast in the in world, England, in England. <laughs> universe, in England, and Stig's basically fucked you off. Oh, oh Mrs. Doubtfire's not doing his job. <laughs> hey, <laughs> one job. He's not looking after you properly. <laughs> you will tell him to sort it out. <laughs> Matt is going to sort it out for you, mate. But that's, not, it up, that's not the end of it. That's not the end at all. Laughing emoji on the side. This is the reply Classic. back from the... No, thanks, you can't even spell my name. Got got to cut a man some slack for a typo. It Being was confident. early and I've got fat fingers. <laughs> Don't know what, what, what difference that makes. like, but But no worries, all the best. If you find it in your heart to forgive me at any time in the future, we'd love to have you on. Is it a reply? Yeah, have I. Where's the reply? Oh. The reply is... <laughs> for, wink, the, for the audio listeners... Tongo, winky the, tongo, for the audio listeners, the winky tongue emoji. And he's put Stig with a kiss. With that, a kiss. Right. I don't think that was Stig. No. <laughs> <laughs> So oh, where, where can we? There's a lot of questions there, aren't they? What did you? Uh, is a proof, proofread your original no, message? No, it was it was early morning. Uh, you know, just when you just feel it a bit. You wake, a bit up, with a hard, wake up with a hard on. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. think of Sig Dofty. <laughs> and it, yeah, I mean, I'm pretty sure I spelled his name, but it must have auto corrected or some. I don't know. Got to cut a man some slack. Got to cut a man some slack. I know. Uh, well, I thought like he's. He, 
he's coming in with a bit of because he's winky faced at the end, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll come in like. Do you think he was flirting having a bit of a crack? Yeah, but he's he's giving me a sticky out tongue. No thanks. Face. You can't even spell my name. <laughs> he's give us a sticky out tongue face. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a good emoji. <laughs> That's a good response. I, I, I took positives from that. <laughs> so, what's your next uh, line of attack? Well, I think if I, I think the listeners could help us out here. Is he on Twitter and that? Yeah, just give give Stig, Stig a nudge and just say he, could, he but, can find it in his heart to forgive us. But yeah. please for, forgive you. Forgive me. Yeah. On behalf of us. Yeah. But what you need to do is please, please do spell his name correctly. Yeah. Yeah. He'd actually know what they're on about as well, though. Oh, they? yeah. I'll go in with you. Might Sig. even be going with Sig. You've Siggy. got to get on under the cosh. Come on, Sig. Sig. Just forgive forgive the bald idiot. So, so that's basically what we've got to work with. Hi, Sig. <laughs> to the best Hope, has done it. Hi, Sig. Do you know what I mean? Hope you and the family are well. <laughs> I wonder how many times we've heard that. It was a mistake, wasn't it? Yeah. Just it happens a, to the best. It's a typo. It's, us. it's a typo. <laughs> No. But proactive, Chris. Keep that up. Exactly. And yeah. Yeah. We yeah. will get somebody I mean, on eventually. Yeah. No thanks. You can't even spell my name. Well, at least I've messaged him, John. You don't even message. I don't him. know. You can't even spell the names wrong, can you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, come out, come out, all guns blazing. Anyway, with a scathing attack. <laughs> out of nowhere. Yeah. Well, should I we see. get Jimmy in? Yeah. 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 Come yeah. on, Jimmy. We've had Andy Woodman on. Yeah, and he was, he was. Yeah, no, Woody's your mate, wasn't he? We was in the youth team together yeah. at Palace. He was telling us about his patio. <laughs> yeah, no, that was a good day. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where we were going. I think we was at Brentford. I'm thinking now we're at Brentford together because we, we had a few clubs together and we were playing cards on the bus and he was a white boy, Woody. He was always, he was probably cheating to be fair, but he, <laughs> <laughs> but he, uh, he had me a cards that day. I think 600 quid I lost to him. And he's he he told me to pay for his patio, which was nice, really, isn't it? Every time you think you're having a garden party yeah. and you think of Jimmy Glass, it's nice. I think. <laughs> <laughs> At least you know he's not wasting it, don't you? Yeah, he's putting it to good use. No, he, good. he gave it the official title, the Jimmy Glass pl- Patio. I, yeah, I'm not sure nice. if he's got a plaque, actually, he said. <laughs> that's nice of him, yeah. he tell you the story about Gareth when, when he, he might not, I thought this might be too personal, but when we actually used to room together sometimes. I remember in Italy, me, Gareth, and Woody, we, we roomed together. And they were very close Southgate. Yeah, sorry. Gareth Southgate, the England manager, I should say. Because <laughs> <laughs> we was all, we all come out of Palace together. So I think I've got this right, but he they get, they sort of talked to it when they were kids. They said, right, whichever one makes it famous first, buys the other one a watch. So like they were joking about. And I think it was Woody's 30th. I think it was his 30th. He, um, so obviously Gareth went on. He went on to play for Palace. He went on to play for various other clubs. Had a good career, play for England. And I think Woody opened his birthday card from Gareth on his 30th and he had a 10 grand check in there where Gareth said, go and buy yourself that watch. You oh, know? that's fair. Yeah. If that's a personal story, I'm sorry to anyone. <laughs> I think it's in their books. They've got a book, Woody yeah. and Nord. Yeah, yeah. I think it's in there, but it, or whatever Woody told me, I can't remember, but it just shows who Gareth is. I got you £60 worth of Miller and Carter vouchers for your 40. Yeah, that cost me 120 for the meal. <laughs> for my 40, like, that's what I got. £60 in Miller and Carter and it was fucking 120 for the meal. <laughs> but, yeah, but, but Gareth obviously knew that Woody liked watches, so Chris knows that you like a steak. Exactly. <laughs> I do, but I'd have preferred £120 of the vouchers. <laughs> to be fair with that, though, are you like, are you thinking, I wish you'd have fucking actually put a box on the table with a watch in but you can pick hey, your own yeah pick your own pick like, your yeah. own then 10 grand in as well good it's point not a well. is it yeah that's right good point well made mm. Mm. good times coming through at Palace yeah, yeah. it was a, it was a because at the time Palace won the up again because Palace had their waves didn't they they were yeah. the team of the 80s team of the 70s the team of the 90s under Steve Koppel and, and Woody was I think a year or two was he two years he might have been two years older than me and the year our sons of YTS Palace went into the old first division. So in that era, Palace had a good few years, had a few years in the Premier League, uh, got the FA Cup final in 1990. And obviously their team was like Ian Wright, Mark Bright. Jeff Thomas. And yeah, all Jeff them. Thomas. Yeah, yeah. They, 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 you know, some real, real good lads. Football was very different back then as well, you know, that the change rooms are very different places, as you well know. Very different to what it's like now. You know, it, to come through... You know, you had to be hard, and it was a it was a real hard school, and you had to learn very quickly. And then 
because we had the crazy gang literally just down the road, Wimbledon. And then when they started to break up a little bit, we took on a few of their players. So on one hand, it was fun because the banter in the changing room was really good and really strong. On the other hand, if you if you stepped out of line or didn't show the right sort of respect to, to the right person, you'd find yourself up against a wall. So it was an interesting time at Palace. Me, Woody was, like I say, a year or two older than me, but we're in a youth team together at the same time because of like a dodgy birthday. Or we both had August birthdays. And we were very different characters, me and Andy Woodman. Andy Woodman was funny. Everyone loved him, you know. He was just such a great lad. Whereas me, I was a bit more... A bit of a twat, really, I suppose. <laughs> you not where? No, I think if this... If I'm on, when I was younger, I, you know, I'd, I wrote a book in... I didn't actually, someone wrote it for me. But in 2004, I had a, a, an autobiography out that I wanted to write after football and explain that like, I had issues, essentially. I grew up with issues, like if I'm honest, they would call it now mental health issues and everyone's got them in football. But back then, they were just issues. And on one hand, I love football and love playing and, and always felt, even to this day, I was a good goalkeeper. But on the other hand, I didn't like the the, the unfairness of things and couldn't cope with sometimes, you know, being blamed for something that weren't my fault. So I'd be a bit volatile yeah. emotionally as well. So in that environment, that real tough, hard School, uh, school environment, if, if you're not really, really mentally tough and kind of really focused and, and confident in your ability, then it's hard. You yeah. know? Whereas on one hand, I could do all the things and I was in there because of the potential I had. On the other hand, I'd just fall out with people. And not because I'm a, a, an arsehole. It's just that the game's a tough game. And mm. you, you boys know it's a tough game. Would you it know? not be confident, sir? Would, would it... You know, when you're saying you, you've got to be tough, you know, if someone had a go at you or something, would it knock your confidence confidence in when you were training and playing and stuff? And that's the problem. See, as a goalie, like you go, people think goalies are mad. We're not mad, we're just slightly different. And, you know, they say, you know, goalies have got to be tough. You know, they've got to be strong. Now, diving in at people's feet and getting kicked in the face is, is one element of being tough, but you kind of do that second nature. Toughness as a goalie really comes from dropping across, conceding a goal... And coming for the next cross, yeah. it's mental toughness, yeah. and that's what goalkeepers need, and that's what they have to have. They have to have a resilience, like a shield, as it were, you know, where they don't let people get to them. You have to go out, do your best, and I only learned this after, by the way. I <laughs> if I'd known it's at all the great time, answer, if I'd known it at the time, I wouldn't be saying, "Well, you ought to be on a sun seeker somewhere." Tell me. <laughs> You know? <laughs> would, it, would it still come to you? <laughs> <laughs> me wherever I was. You know, because but that is that's what I learned about football after football. And you know what? I only really learned that afterwards when I went away and had to work on my my psychology and stuff because I, I developed a gambling habit, which we can talk about if you want. But I had to go and work out psychology, and I just didn't understand it when I was a football, and I had no idea. And we didn't have people in football back in the early nineties that understood anything about psychology whatsoever. If you were lucky, you know, you maybe you come from a balanced home and, you know, you had a bit of mental resilience yourself yeah. and you had to have to, to make it through those days. Just, but the amount of players, sorry, the amount of players that, that we lost, probably generations we lost of quality top players because their psychology wasn't quite right and it could have been sorted out with the right work. Yeah, you know, and, and that's and with the, it's so different to the game now. I mean, the game now, you, you literally the players have every possible thing. So it was, it was, it was quite hard. It's a hard environment to grow up in. Yeah, and yeah. like I say, for Woody, Andy Woodman, and like he was funny. He could he could brush it all off. He was funny. Yeah. But for me, I was a little bit more intense, and and I think that I carried that into my career, which is probably why. I, I listen. You're gonna laugh at me, but well, no, you're probably not actually. What you got to do is read Wikipedia. <laughs> I didn't fulfil my potential at all as a goalie. You know, let's get let's, let's, let's get the elephant. I scored a goal for Carlisle, <laughs> but you know, and which was great. But that wasn't uh, the career I probably should have had. Mm. In my defence, I, I fractured both my scaphoids when I was eighteen. The youth team we just won the league, got to the FA Youth Cup final. The class of '92, the United team, the famous one. I played in that final. It was against us, the Palace team. So I'd come out of the Palace out of my youth set up and out my YTS in good shape. So I got given a pro contract, you know, and it was all looking really rosy. But then I fractured both my scaphoids about three months apart. And if not, scaphoids are bone in the bottom of your thumb. And for a goalkeeper, it's a death sentence, essentially. And it took me 20 months to get fit again. 
And that was when I was 18. You know, so and I got fit. I got pins in my wrist still, and I got fit and got back into football. So in some ways, maybe I did fulfil all I was ever going to fulfil. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but in other ways, when I look back now and I look back at the players I played with, and the ability I think I had, I know it sounds bold, but... You know, I, I, I won a bad goalie. I could take crosses. I could stop shots. I could kick the ball wherever you wanted me to kick it. I was dribbling around forwards twenty years ago, so I'd probably be worth. I'll be worth millions. Now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just never really fulfilled my potential. And and you know, looking Is back, that- it's the reason why it was probably because my psychology more than my ability. A very quick breaking play, ladies and gentlemen, to tell you about Spitch. Now, what a game this is, by the way. Spitch is the new ultimate football fantasy manager game where you can prove your skills against other managers and, get this, win real money. Now, you've got to be 18 or over to play, but the app's now available in the UK, Germany, Austria and Brazil. It's the Fantasy Football Manager app and it lets you build your own team, you collect points and then you can battle it out with other managers within the app and it's completely free. And not just that, you can compete against your friends in different communities and with a chance to win a share, here's the big one, of up to £70,000 every week. You heard me right though, there's chances of winning every week. It's not just over the course of the season, there's weekly competition, so more chances of getting them points in and winning a bit of cash. The app is absolutely jam-packed full of all the stats, the facts, previous results, who's on form, all the statistical analysis to pick your best team for the week and your captain as well, get them double points in. And you can download the app now completely free. All you've got to do is follow the link in the description. But remember, Spitch is an 18 plus game, begambleaware.org, and it's available for download now. Free, just follow that link in the UK, Germany, Austria, and Brazil. Is that why you think you've got an interest in it now, the psychology? Because it maybe provides some answers. It, it, that's absolutely spot on and but it's funny I actually learnt it ridiculously enough sat in my taxi eventually ended up driving a taxi for 13 years and it was only when I was actually sat in my taxi because you get a lot of time as a taxi driver <laughs> I don't know if you noticed to think about life you know you're contemplating when you when the radio's on you're listening to the World Cup goalie's running up and he's going to do a Jimmy Glass <laughs> <laughs> Colombia versus Brazil <laughs> He's going to do a Jimmy Glass. <laughs> and I'm sat here in my taxi on a ranking Wimborne going, oh, shit. <laughs> you know, where's it gone wrong? And, and the reality is that's when I really put effort and time into thinking about the psychology and my psychology. And then I realised that in truth, all the years of being a footballer and, and the shit support you got, you know, that's one thing. But ultimately, I had a, I had a, I had a, I had a um, responsibility to myself where I should have gone and searched out. I should have found whatever it was I needed because, because ultimately, re- eventually, re- the responsibility comes down to yourself as a footballer. So you that- had many run- sorry, Chris, did you had many run-ins with the older pros. You know, when you were saying you had a, you had the banter and that's good, but you'll end up against the wall. Well, we funny- talk about this character building, don't we? Yeah. There yeah. Was- funny enough. Funny enough. One of One of my favourite players of all time, who I look up to as a player, um, because I thought he was amazing, was Ian Wright. Now, Ian Wright as a forward could do everything. You know, he had everything in his locker. He had tenacity, he had, you know, he could finish both feet. And he didn't, that wasn't a natural thing. Couple drilled him. It was normally me and goal, like, (laughs) <laughs> like, 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 like he was drilling him against his <laughs> confidence fucking shot like, to shit in it he yeah. put away he's get, took 10 get, shots and 9 have gone in basically get, get, that's why he went on to an unbelievable career he's so <laughs> confident after playing against me but he was awesome you know he was awesome he, on the pitch he was just a force to be reckoned with and that's why he went on and did what he did you know for, for Arsenal I mean, he's no bigger club at the time than Arsenal but off the pitch he was a really difficult character Really difficult. You know, he had a, he did have a chip on his shoulder coming out of non-league. He was a plumber and he got into Palace and then, you know, he was hungry to succeed. And for whatever reason, I was I think I was only 16 and we had a Barney one day, you know, and I was because I trained with the first team a lot with Palace. And and funny enough, I actually didn't always play in goal. I actually used to run around on pitch quite a lot because I was a frustrated forward. <laughs> <laughs> and I know everyone goes, oh, all keepers are frustrated. Yeah, I've got one league goal, by the way. Just <laughs> <laughs> it's <laughs> all that. <laughs> <laughs> 15 years of master striker and all that. <laughs> so it was like, you know, 
couple used to love me training on, but he just used because I used to run around like a lunatic. But for whatever reason, I just had this ability to score goals. Even as a 16 year old, I trained with the first team at Palace, Premier League club, by the way. And you got the third choice goalkeeper with two fractured wrists running around scoring more goals than the forwards. <laughs> 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 so, hang on, I've got where we're going. Where are we going with this Righty. question? Yeah. So, righty. So, righty just had this, he had this angry element to him when he played, and which on, so on match days was brilliant because it made him the player he was. But day to day, he was, he was quite ferocious and fiery. And I remember one training session, I, I was playing and and I uh, and one of his mates, Tony Finnegan, um, he did something and I went, what are you doing, Tony? Fuck's sake. You know, and the thing is, they want you as a young player to be respectful and not speak back to them. And, but, but on the flip side, if you're playing in the game and you're in training and you're a goalie, you can't be a wallflower. You know, you've got to be tough. You've got to be, you know, you've got to be able to stand your ground. And, and he took exception to that, Ian, and he came out of the game. I mean, he was trying to punch me and the players were pulling him off. I was only 16. How old was he? Um, 26, probably 25, 26 at the time. And he's but, trying to punch a 16-year-old goalkeeper. Where yes, from? Yeah. Yeah. Shows how annoying I was. <laughs> <laughs> you know, listen, I'm probably, that's how I remember it. And I remember we had a proper Barney and we ne he never spoke to me again. And then, I don't know, a few months later, he got transferred to Arsenal, which was always a, one of my sort of regrets because I, I actually respected him as a forward, as a player. So, yeah, no, you did. You had to, you know, they I've seen players pin YTS trainees against a wall because they put their boots on or because they talk back to them or stuff like that. That was what it was like. It was definitely, you know, you had to be tough to come through those those days in football. Have some good times in that time though, you know, the trips away and... I've made it sound horrendous, haven't I? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? My first experience of football was Crystal Palace. Ron Nodes was a manager. Colourful character, Nodesy. Um Steve Coppel and then um, our youth team manager, our first youth team manager was a guy called Alan, Alan Smith who went on to manage Fulham and and not the striker, Alan Smith, another guy. Now, Alan was a really interesting character. Alan, he made, he had to retire early for injury, um, made, went and made some money for himself. I think Sportswear Company, I can't remember exactly. A really colourful car, a better car than the chairman. You know, he's a youth team manager, drove his XJS and stuff like that. You know. <laughs> had a better suntan than, I don't know, um, Ron Atkinson basically yeah <laughs> essentially yeah and just a real character now he had the youth team and he loved the holiday he literally loved the trip and because he had the funds to do it he used to take we used to go all over the place in the in the youth team at Palace we had better trips than the first team we'd go off to oh, he'd pay he'd pay or, or he'd try and get some money out of Nodi and then Nodi would want to come and it was funny one trip actually talking about Andy Woodman earlier this, is, this always makes me chuckle we were in Via Reggio, big, big, big tournament, like AC Milan, Inter Milan, Fiorentina, Paris Saint, you know, big clubs from Europe. And there's us, Crystal Palace. And Woody was playing in goal, actually. I never played, I was gutted, but because he was two years older than me, that first year he played and I was just there for the ride, which weren't bad to be fair. It's not really. <laughs> um, and uh, I mean, we were sat in a bar one night <clears throat> and we'd had a couple of beers. I don't know, what about 16? <laughs> and, uh, and Noji's there and he had his wife with him and uh, I think Alan Smith was there and Woody and Gareth Southgate would have been there and we sat there and uh, Nosey said we're sorry for you but he got up you know he always used to wear these white white loafers white paint and loafers he had this is like his trademark <laughs> so he got up and he went it's alright for you boys I've got to go back and perform now and it was like a bit quiet everyone thought okay and then Woody piped up and said well if you can't chairman I will <laughs> <laughs> he's, like, he's, he's like the 18 year old U2 kid. <laughs> you know, I bet he didn't tell you that story, did you? You know? And it was, it was, it was some, <laughs> there were just some big characters in them days. And, and then, and then like a couple of seasons later, you sign the likes of Chris Coleman and people like that, you know, other big characters. And it was, and we used to have great trips. Do you talk about, obviously, knocking on that door? Were you, was that not something that you were doing? Um, especially when, with Nigel Martin in front of you, was it just not, not an option? Were you, but, but you know, the funny thing is I got, so I got, I got injured and I got myself back fit again and, and I let Woody go and I got fit and I was number two tonight. I was 21 they were in the Premier League. I was number two. I got fit. Things are looking great. So I was so excited. I've just been injured for two years. I'm, I'm 
raring to go. And then we were away on pre-season trip to Portugal. And Niger had a double hernia. This is pre-season. So I'm 21, Palace are in the Premier League. I'm thinking, OK, it's good. I'm going to play some pre-season games. You know, I've got a chance. Now, don't get me wrong, listen, Nigel Martin's fit, he's playing. But I had a chance to get in that first team, something I've been trying to do for years, you know. Good. <laughs> You're hoping he gets an infection in his wounds and all that. <laughs> well, I wasn't hoping. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't hoping, no. But he's a good lad, Nigel, well, lazy. But uh, yeah, that's what I'm going to play some pre-season games now. I'm going to, you know, they're going to show them what I'm about. And then... Ray was doing a keep ball with some some of the lads, and I'm sat down stretching. Again, we never had a goalie coach. I'm on my own, so I'm on a pre-season trip. But I'm on my own. I'm sat down stretching, and Ray went, oh, come and join in, Jim. Come and join in. So I went and joined in this keep ball and, and bobbing it about. And literally, he's, he's, he's done me a step over. I've gone one way, my knee's gone the other. And I tore my cartilage. And I, was, and I didn't play for another four months. And I'm like, and by the time I got fit again, they had to sign Reese Wilmot. And Reese had come in as number two behind Nigel. And Reese was a good lad, good solid keeper. He come in behind Nigel. I'm now sharing reserve games, and and that's what done me really. But then the worst thing was just before I left, they were that's it. They're in the Premier League. I think they're in relegation. No, they weren't. No, Division One. Sorry, First Division. You know, what is now Championship? And and it looks like they're going up. So I think, well, they're going to go up. So Nigel's there, Reese is there, they're going to go up. And that's why I left. And then for whatever reason, it went south on them. They lost in a playoff final, I think to Leicester. And literally, they sold Nigel. So about two months after I went to Bournemouth, they sold Nigel to Leeds. I think Reese left. And they debutised two keepers younger than me, like in the first team, the, the next pre-season. You know where sometimes in life you do I what you think is right. You can only do what you think is right. You look at a situation, you go, I need to play football. They're going in the Premier League, Nigel's there. And that happened to me a couple of times. Like I say, with a tour the cartilage and, and then coming out of the youth team, breaking my scaphoids. And not, for whatever reason, my career, I try to make the right decisions. And then you turn left and you sure turn right. And there was a couple of others afterwards. It was, it was only when you look back and reflect and you go, actually, I don't generally believe in luck. I try not to. I think you've got to make your own. There's obviously things that happen to you, you know. Sliding door again, moments, isn't it? But it yeah. is. It's sliding door moments. But again, you know? it's like you were saying, you've got to search these things out yourself. You've got to do it yourself. You've That's what you've done. And it's just been unlucky. You saying, I've got to, I, I'm, I want to go and play football. I'm going to Bournemouth. It's you saying, I'm doing it myself. Well, I went to Bournemouth. How long do you wait for? Yeah. Listen, I went to Bournemouth and I, I never got on my mail. I, I was always certain I probably wouldn't sign a new contract. But I played a lot of games at Bournemouth. You're straight in? Yeah, straight in, played till played finished the season off. Um started to start the next season but fell out with Mel. What was the fallout over? Was it some he's digging just, you out for something that wasn't yeah, your fault? Just, yeah, you know, listen, I'm, I made mistakes, of course I did. I'm, I'm a goalie. You're gonna make mistakes, you're gonna let in your shitty goal. But it was like you're going off three deflections off a legs in front of you and he'd be looking to blame you. And you're coming at half time and like you're one nil down away at Bristol City. And he'd spend 15 minutes just hammering the goalie as opposed to working out <laughs> what he was going to do tactically. What, what the rest of the problems were. Yeah, you know, and listen, I'm not digging Mel out. I think everyone ever played for Mel knows the same and I told him to his face. You know, later in life, I made up with Mel and, I, you know, he's, 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 he's been unwell. So, you know, I wish him all the best. I see, I see him occasionally because of Bournemouth. But that was just the way it was and I kind of knew that we were going to struggle. Now, the club itself was struggling financially at the time, was in massive problems. And I was there at the stage when it had its first kind of real moment where it was going to go bust in 97. And um, we got people at the Winter Gardens, which was the old concert hall in town, filled up with 3,000 people. They put 30 grand in buckets one night. Um, and the receiver was there. He decided not to close the club down. Then we went on a like a run. Was it that close then? It was, yeah. The, it was the, the receivers? Yeah, yeah, he was going to close the club. The receiver yeah. were there to just collect the, take the buckets? Basically, he was there to talk to the town and say, look, <laughs> this is where we're at. The club, well, this is where yeah. we're at. Receiver was there saying, right, this is where he's a nice guy, he was actually. And then he saw the 30 grand and he went, okay, well, it could be something here. And then the fans, it's the first time the fans have done it. They got together in a community trust fund and they bought the club. They bought the club from the receiver, you know, agreed with the bank. Yeah. And that's what kept Bournemouth alive. I mean, Bournemouth was so close to going under and would never have come back. So is that a vision of this receiver just putting buckets of pound coins in his boot? <laughs> 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 well, no. Yeah. Tipping it into the Tesco. We're literally, I'm carrying two buckets, walking up down the aisles, collecting money. Well, I dropped them twice, but... 
<laughs> but it was, it was that close to Bournemouth. Um, and then we, but then we went on a run for some reason. I don't know why we went on a run. We ended up um, doing well in the league. We didn't get promotion, but we went to Wembley. We got to Wembley in the auto windscreens final against Grimsby, 98. But I always knew, I always knew I wouldn't sign. And as the season was getting closer towards the end, we got to Wembley and I was hearing whispers from people that Mel was trying to sign McCloscoe from West Ham on loan just to play in the final. For the one game? Yeah. I'd kept four clean sheets in five games to go to Wembley. That's I'd, a to be fair, I had a shit game in the <laughs> semi-final, second leg. I wasn't brilliant. I don't know why. But I did... We just we just had that relationship, so I knew I knew I wouldn't be staying at Bournemouth, which was I was disappointed about because I, I loved playing, I enjoyed playing there, even though it was hard because I was always under the, you know, the the pressure of Mel. So I left Bournemouth, my contract expired. I knew I wasn't going to sign another one because of Mel, and I'm in the summer and I'm out of contract, and I'm like I'm a bit twitchy, and a few clubs had sort of shown interest, but no one really had bitten. Um, I had a new agent. Gary O'Reilly was at Palace with Central Defender. He was my agent. And he's a good lad, gal, but I'm not sure how good he was an agent. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> top bloke, though, that's important. But then Swindon came in for me. Steve McMahon. And then everyone that knows Mac and knows that he's 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 a solid character, hard character. He's a fair, he's a fair character, but he's quite volatile. And, and at that point in the summer, I was getting closer and I'm thinking, I, I just want I, I want a club, you know? And, and they come in and offer me a four-year deal. So I went there and I thought I was going to play. And in the first game of the season, the way at Sheffield United, I remember, you know, that I was really excited. and got in a change room and he he, picked, he played Frank. And I'm like, Tsss. you know? And after the shit I had at Bournemouth, after doing well for Bournemouth and, and actually did well for him as a goalie, and then you feel, oh, here we go again. But to be fair, much. though, they gave you a four-year deal. They gave me a four-year deal. So you think... Four-year deal's yeah, like... it is. It is, and that's exactly right. And then I'm four weeks in, I'm playing reserve games, and I'm just, I'm pissed off now. I'm in Swindon. I don't want to be in Swindon. I'm not playing. And I remember we played QPR in a reserve game. We lost 4-0. Vinnie Jones scored from 25 yards. Maybe even 30. <laughs> <laughs> And when Vinnie Jones beats you from 30 yards, <laughs> all right, and, and, and obviously Vinnie and Stephen <laughs> after the 88 FA Cup final where Wimbledon beat Liverpool and I think Vinnie wiped him out in the first minute, you know. He, he wiped he, him out, didn't he? He did. Proper, yeah. Vinnie, Vinnie proper wiped Steve out in the first. So he obviously, that was like an icing on a cake for Steve. And Steve come in and he's got his red face on. He's fucking crazy in the change room and hammering everyone in. This is a reserve game. And then he come for me. I just lost it, and I, I took my gloves off, took my boots off. I just threw him in the middle. He said, "What are you doing?" I said, "I'm dumb." I said, "I'd fucking dumb you." And he went, "You what?" I said, "I'm dumb you." I said, "I fucking don't even like you." <laughs> <laughs> you <laughs> That's what I said to him. I said, "I don't even fuck knows what I was thinking." I did like him actually. I did like him. I liked him a lot. I fuck knows what I was thinking. I was gone. And my, my brain had gone. And funny enough, for the one time in my life, we had like a goalie coach. And he was, he was only, he wasn't full time. He came and he was doing a couple of days. Poor lad, he, he'd been in Italy and he'd been all over Europe learning his trade. And he had this folder and stuff. He came to Swindon for about two nights, had his car broken into, nicked a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember, his, I can't remember what his name was. But it was, just, it was a good lad. <laughs> I don't know why he came to Swindon and nicked, nicked his whole life's work in one. <laughs> What were you doing today? I don't know, the nip, yeah. nip it folder. <laughs> and he said to, to, to I remember this, he was funny, Steve. So he's like, he's taken back. He's like, it's fucking no one's taught me like that before, am I, Jay? He's taken back. Bear in mind, you've still got three, no, no. three years and 10, 11 Basically, months on your contract. Essentially. And he's taken away, he said, and he said, to me, he said well, what about, I think his name was Willow, what about Willow? Willow? Do you like Willow? I went, yeah, I like Willow. I went, well, you fucking tell him Willow. <laughs> 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 so I've gone over and I like I've gone over and I've sort of sat and I thought, oh, what have I done? You know? Moment of madness. Yeah, I just frustration. So I basically went to sleep, got up the next day, went in first thing, went, knocked on his door, and I just said, oh, I'm so sorry. I said, yeah, that was that was wrong. I should have done that. You know, I don't dislike you. <laughs> <laughs> You're all right, I Steve. Like you. a coffee. <laughs> I don't dislike you. I just I'm just struggling. 
I'm struggling, not playing. I'm struggling being here and not playing. And he went, and do you know what? He was all right. Fair player. Yeah, he said, you're all right, Jim. He said, I know you're not a bad lad. He said, I know that. He said, there are poison players. He said, I know you're not one of them. And it just went from there. And then, do you know what? Uh, Steve was struggling and then he got sacked. And then Jimmy Quinn come in. I didn't know Jim, but he, was, he had a connection with Bournemouth and I thought that would go well. But it didn't. Jimmy was just, he, was, he, was, he wasn't, um, like I say, utmost respect for him as a forward. I thought he was brilliant forward. He was still playing, he was 40 and he was still playing reserve games and banging in goals for Swindon then. He was unbelievable, but but he just, <laughs> he was a strange fella. Is fr- this from the off friction between you? No, not really. No, I just think he, we had a, basically we were playing Bolton away. The, the team was struggling. And I think um, we went to, I remember the last game I played for Swindon, we went to Bolton away and Bolton were up near the top. We were bottom. And it was hammering down the rain Saturday afternoon um, um, we basically it was nil nil literally till the 89th minute <clears throat> and I'd, I'd kept everything out the whole day I'd, I'd, I was man of match you know in terms of I'd made save after save after save and then I let one slip in under my body which I should have saved you know and, and then we ended up losing the game and they scored two actually quick succession and I've come in after the game and then Jimmy Quinn's just come for me he's just literally come for me just ripped me to shreds in the change room and just said he's embarrassed and, you know, he's, and then not only that, because I told him to fuck off, obviously, because he would do. Do you know what? Do you know what? I don't like you. <laughs> I didn't even bother telling him I didn't like him. I didn't even about it. But I told him to fuck off. And then, and then what he did was he went straight, he went out and went to the, the press and destroyed me in the press, like hammered me. Just said 10 players played their heart and out, let down by one. We didn't have a shot on the, the Bolton goal for 90 minutes. We didn't have a shot on target for 90 minutes. And we were literally just defending for 90 minutes. And, and, you and I literally got to 89 minutes. I made loads of stuff and then I made a mistake, you know? And he went to town on me, literally ripped me to shreds. Um, so much so that even Swindon fans, have, like after that, weren't having him. They're like, you can't treat your players like that. And the, the irony was every newspaper printed it on the Monday morning where it's let down by one player, I've never seen such a goal go in, embarrassing, you know, but just ripped me to shreds. And then at the end of every article, and I kid you not, at the end of every article, man of the match, Jimmy Glass. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so you just, you've seen this manager rip you to shreds, <laughs> which you know is unfair, <laughs> You know, and then another man of match, Jimmy Glass. <laughs> and that's, for whatever reason, that was my career. For whatever reason. And, that, it is, and don't get me wrong, it must have been elements of me in it. But on the, on the flip side, you just, there were people involved with football that just shouldn't have been, in, they shouldn't have been allowed anywhere near a changing room, not as managers. Because they just didn't have any sort of ability to do the job. And then that, for whatever reason, I seem to come up against these people. And by the way, I'm not including Steve McMahon in that. He was, he was a top lad. And that was my fault. Did but the Jimmy Quinn thing was just embarrassing. Did, did you have it out? No, he was, he was going, you know. And this is the problem I had. The problem I had, very naive. I'd, I'd end up tearing up two and a half years of my car. I just wanted out. So I just tore my contract up and wanted to leave. Um, but this, by the way, this is at the end. This is at the end. This is after two years. Obviously, in the middle of this, I went on loan to Carlisle and scored for him. <laughs> which I'm sure you're going to want to talk about in a minute. Well, <laughs> we'd we'll, 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 we'll all like to get on to it. I think that wound up Jimmy Quinn even more, because I think he sent me to Carlisle to fail. Yeah, he, just yeah, to get, he just wanted to get we'll rid of me. Worse, son. Go on, off you go. Yeah. You know, like three games left the season, I think he wanted me to fail. Um, and I've come back, I've come back well famous. Come back a fucking <laughs> hero. <laughs> you know? Was, was Going like... to Swindon on a chalice. <laughs> did, he get, did he get to shouting when you came in the day after the article? Did you confront him or? No, I can't remember what happened. I think he pulled me into his office and talked to me about it. So I can't remember what he said, but I just, I'd gone. I was done. Yeah. I was done at that stage. And then I just, you know, I, I went in, I said to him, look, I don't know, whatever, I'd left 150 grand on my contract. I said, I wouldn't earn, earn any mega money. I just said, look, give me 40 grand and I'll go. And this this sums up my time at Swindon. It's probably why I don't like Swindon so much. He went, yeah, okay, all right, fine. So you saw it out with the club secretary and, and hang on, I went in 40 grand, 25 grand it was. So I went to see the, the the club accounts guy or sector, I can't remember who it was, and he says, yeah, okay, well, we'll pay you 12 and a half on this date and 12 and a half on that date. I'm like, okay. So the date comes and I'm training at 
Cambridge now. I've gone Cambridge for a week or two, or whatever. And uh, and I'm looking at my bank in the morning. It's not there. And I'm phoning him saying, yeah, I've got no payment. Is it okay? Yeah, it's coming this afternoon. 12 o'clock, they went <laughs> to administration. So oh. I told my contracts up. <laughs> told my contracts up to walk away to go and play. But it's funny. You know, you've got to look back and laugh at it now. But well, at the time, hard to laugh at it, though. But at the time, it's, it's a real struggle. You think, why am I bothering doing this? What yeah. is the point? Yeah, this, this sums me up. There's three games left of the season. We're about to go on summer break. It's been a crap season. You know, I'm thinking, where am I going to go for holiday? You know? I get called into the manager's office, three games to go, and, and oh, Carl, I'll come in for you. And I'm like, well, it's after the deadline. Which is, yeah, but they've got special dispensation, their keeper's injured, that you can get, they can sign you. Do you want to go? And without even thinking about it, I mean, bear in mind, again, this shows my knowledge of football. I went, yeah, I'll go. Now, I, I don't even know Carlisle or bottom of League Division 3. <laughs> 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 I don't even know that they're in a relegation battle with Scarborough. I don't even know. And do you know what? I didn't care. I just wanted to play football. It's all Did I you know where it were geographically? I knew it was because we'd been there and got Dick 4-0 <laughs> <laughs> and had the coach journey home <laughs> waiting for Mel Mason to call you to the front when I was at Bournemouth. You know, so I knew where it was geographically. I knew it was all the way up the top. But I didn't know what, what league they were in. I didn't know what league they were in at that point. I, I just wasn't... I know I sound really bad now, but I literally just loved playing football. I wasn't interested in all the other stuff, all the stats, all the stuff that went on. I just would put my gloves on thing is you've um, got a chance now though you were saying three games left I'm thinking well going on my holidays you, you're signing for a team and you, you're going to be starting and the important games it's just they want you alone you're going to play but I didn't know how important it was why and, why, why do they why do they need have they, is the keeper injured is... basically at the time Carlisle were under the the guidance of the colourful character that was Michael Knighton now you might remember Michael Knighton and they mentioned him this week uh, I think that the Newcastle owners are out juggling balls and kicking balls on the pitch after the Palace game. When Michael Knighton's famous for trying to buy Man United, going dressing up in a full Man United kit and going in front of the Stretford end, juggling the ball, keeping the ball up, before he even bought the club. Transpired <laughs> he didn't have the money to buy the club. <laughs> <laughs> we like played it. Old Trafford. <laughs> you know, he didn't have the money to buy the club. He was never going to buy Man United, but he got himself dressed up in a full kit and kicking the ball up in front of the Stretford end. That's Michael Knighton. <laughs> <laughs> he went on then to buy Carlisle United at some point in the in the not too distant future, and and actually brought him a little bit of success to start with, and they had a couple of trips to Wembley and stuff. And but ultimately, at this particular point, was was hated by the fans, um, because the fans thought he was stripping the assets out of the club. And funnily enough, on transfer deadline day, he sold Tony Keg who's a goalie and fans much love goalie for £5,000. You know, and they're, they're in a relegation battle. And they've sold the number one. Yeah, they sold the number one for five grand to, I think, to Barry. You know, and they're in a relegation. The fans hated him. And I didn't know any of this. <laughs> so I've got in my car. So, so I said to Jimmy Quinn, yeah, OK, I've got in my car. He said, OK, well, Nigel Pearson will call you. OK, great. I've got in my car. I'm driving back from Swindon to London to my dad's. And I phoned my dad. I said, Dad, I'm going alone to Carlisle. He went, oh, OK, son. All right. Um, puts the phone down. Phones me back about 30 seconds later. He'd been on CFAX. The old, uh, you, you don't remember CFAX? Uh, but yeah, yeah. Teletext. So basically yeah. Teletext, because he didn't have internet then. He'd been on Teletext, looks at the league standings. <laughs> he said, you do realise where Carlisle are, don't you? I went, yeah, they're up north. He know, you do realise where they are in the league? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, no, I don't know where they are. He said they're second to bottom of the third division, which is the low, the lowest tier at this point. I went, oh, well, you know, I just want to play football. And, okay, so I went, gone back. Nigel Pearson's called me. I'm at home. I had a chat with Nigel, quite a quick one. You all right, son? Yep, good, Nigel. Yep, yep. You up for it? Yep, definitely up for it. Right, you'll do me. Now, I don't even... I'd, oh, I always thought... I didn't know if I was his first... He personally tried. He always... Brushes it off and says, "Yeah, you were." You know. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to ask the question: Why did Nigel Pearson pick Jimmy Glass from Swindon? I don't Swindon? know. Listen, I, there were people that I'd been around for a few years now and played games. There were people that knew me. People that you know, if you ever asked Steve Coppel, he'd say I was a good goalkeeper. If, if you asked Mel Machin, he'd say I was a liability. If you know, but there were people. There were enough people in football that said that knew that I was, that, you know, I, I was okay and I could play. And I think at that stage, maybe I was the only one available. Maybe I was the only one that was mental enough to take it on. I don't know. Um, 
But that was it. That was our conversation. He said, right, I'll see you up here tomorrow. We played... Um, I'm trying to remember who we played in our first game. I should know, shouldn't I? Darlow. We played Darlington, first game. Three all, so letting three goals. Good <laughs> start. <Okay. laughs> one, of them was a mix, one of them was a mix up between me and the defender as well. <laughs> all right, so three, three, you three. You to play with <laughs> Three, three. I'm like, okay, all right. You know, can, you, can you actually remember the, obviously you said uh, Kyle was second bottom. Can you actually remember what the points yeah, Carlisle was second. Carlisle hadn't really looked like they were going to go down all season and suddenly went towards oh, the man. bottom. And this is why people hate Knighton so much or dislike Knighton so much. The day before we played the last game, which I'll get to in a minute, Carlisle, <laughs> they they released profits of £1.3 million, which was the fourth highest profit of a football club in the country. <laughs> 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 they just saw keep them five grand. Third or fourth highest profit for, for a company of a football club that season. That's why the fans hate him. He basically stripped the club. Yeah. You know, sorry, Michael, if that's, you don't like that, but that's essentially what the fans thought. That's the fans' opinion. <laughs> you know, but it doesn't sound like working out. <laughs> so Scarborough had gone on a bit of a run. And and they had won a few games. They suddenly got themselves in a position. It looked like it was Scarborough that were going, but they got themselves in a position where they dragged some points back the last few games. And I say, we, we got a point against Darlington at home, 3-3. Free, free. Okay, you know. And, um, and then I'd go home, go back up on a Wednesday again and play the Saturday. And we had um, we had Hartlepool. And I remember it because one of Peter Beers' last games. And, I, and like... I we played against him and I remember making a save, top bins, the hit a free kick. It's like one of my favourite moments because he was a great player, you know, great legend, Peter Beasley, to, to play against him and to, to make a save. I think it was nil-nil. So clean sheet, nil-nil. Got another point. And we went into the last game of the season and basically Scarborough had gone to... Where had they gone to? They played in a the week. They've got another win. So for the first time that season, Carlisle are now bottom of the league. They're bottom of the league by two points. And basically, they had to win the final game. And it might be one point, actually. Plymouth had to lose or draw, and Carlisle had to win, and that was it. The draw wouldn't matter, they had to win. And last day of the season, Scarborough playing Peterborough at Scarborough, and we're playing Plymouth Argyle at Brunton Park. Now, Carlisle, historically, were a big club. You know, back in the days in the 70s, they were top of the first division for a period back in the 70s. They're a big club. They used to get a lot of people watching them. That Their crowds had dwindled. But there they were about 10,000 people at Brunton Park that last game. You know, I think the the official was 8,000. But like I said, Michael Knight had this thing. <laughs> <laughs> he had this thing going on with figures. That he like, <laughs> yeah. 1. 1. 1.4 he meant that year. Yeah. <laughs> but he's, so there are 10,000 people. And it literally comes down to the last day of the season. And I'm now, for whatever reason, I'm in a relegation battle with a team that's been in the Football League for 72 or 74 years. No, 71 years, sorry, at this stage. And for whatever reason, I've not been playing football all season and I'm now in a relegation, the big one of the biggest games of the season for, for a team. Because being relegated out of the Football League is a massive thing yeah. for a team that's been for 71 years a professional club. With the, with the club being stripped as well, if they went down, could could that potentially be? Well, listen, I can only speculate here. Yeah. But many people believe that Michael Knighton had a plan to merge the club with Berwick Rangers and take them into the Scottish League. And that's what they thought was going to happen. If they went down? If they went down. You couldn't... The chances of getting up the Scottish League very quickly and getting into the Premier League were quite promising. Gretna did it. A lot better than yeah. what it would have been taking you know, Carl out of the... It would. So many believe his plan was to strip the club yeah. to take him out into non-league. And I don't... I mean, I'm not speculating, but I mean, if, if that's what I was going to do, I'd probably sell my keeper for five grand, like three days, three games yeah. before the that end of the season. Intention. But you know what I wouldn't do? I would not bring a goal-scoring keeper in. <laughs> that, that's not what, what I would do. <laughs> well, maybe I'll, maybe you look, maybe it was Michael Knight that chose me for, I want this team to go down again, Jimmy Glass. <laughs> Fuck, he's conceded three first game. <laughs> do you know what? All this is speculation, So, but that is what the general consensus was, and that's why the fans really hated him, to the point he asked, he, he asked for a police escort the last game of the season to take him to the game because he was in fear of his life. He was getting death threats. Um, 
And this is a situation I'd plunk myself in. <laughs> you remember how you felt, though? Were you thinking, this is what I've missed? This is what I've well, listen, wanted to be I, a footballer for? You know, I think what Nigel's talking about, when I walked in, I went in with a like that sort of pappy, you know, there was a lot of players playing for Carlisle that were from Cumbria. You know, David Brightwell as well says that you came in and lifted the place. Well, I just, I just, you know, I only, when I trained and when I was kind of played, I could only play in one way, loud and, and bullshy and happy, you know. And the irony is the day before the, the day before the last game we were training, I didn't play in goal, I played up front. <laughs> of course you did. Yeah, scored, it, 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 no, we, did, it. we did five O's, I scored a hat trick. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> this is the ridiculousness of this story. I scored a hat trick the day before. I didn't actually put my gloves on, I don't think. And that's what they laugh about. That's what Bryce laughs about. And that is it because I just went in and I just, you know, where they're all kind of on their knees after a long season. And and so they've had it. Up, they've had it for a long old yeah, time. Yeah, they have. They? And they've been watching it come in and watching the stuff going on at the club behind the scenes and all that. And I'm going in. And I'm just trying to just be me and, and Brian it up. It helps that you didn't know they were bottom of the league as well, so you... <laughs> yeah, it does. One. I didn't know they were bottom of the league too after the last game. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've kept them up. <laughs> What's, What's the... all this fuss about? <laughs> What's but... the tension like in the dressing room before that last game? Eh? Is so, it, is there a bottle of brandy? There was, around? yeah. So it's Nigel's first game, first first season as manager, first half season, mate. his first job in football as a manager, Nigel Pearson. And a Nigel Pearson, great career, solid centre-half, hard as nails. Yeah, this is this is his first job. So Nigel's still really a player. Mindset, he's still a player, you know. So he's thinking, right, well, how would I feel? And he, he, he you know, I think he took him in. I knew I was playing. Obviously, there was no one else, so I had to play. He didn't <laughs> announce the team until the day of the game. Um, and I think they all went in a bit earlier than me. They apparently had a meeting before, and I didn't. I just I turned up normal time. I think he sort of said to him, look, do whatever you got to do to, to get yourself in the right frame of mind for this game. It's just, you know, it's just a massive game. If you think, be- do you think in this meeting he went, oh, do you think it's a duel, lad? Do you think it's a play Jimmy up front? Or <laughs> <laughs> they got a fucking trick yesterday. You know what? <laughs> Man in <laughs> form. I reckon mean, if I had it, I don't reckon we wouldn't have gone down at the last minute. But, um, but he, they, he just, he tried to set them down. He told them the team. He said, right, do whatever you got to do. You, you know, Bright's always says, he says, you know, if you want to have a beer, have a beer. Do what you got to do, you know? And we we got in the change room before the game, and and it was quiet, and it was obviously this. You can imagine you, you played. You can imagine the, the the psychological pressure on the players. Like I say, certainly the ones that Carlisle born and bred. You know, it's mm-hmm. a massive thing for them group grew, grew, growing up in their teams you now to be relegated out of football league. <coughs> I can imagine it could have been life changing for some as well. Yeah, well, it would have. I think it could have been yeah. career ending yeah. for yeah, some. Definitely, mm-hmm. definitely. So, but then in the change room before the game, Nice pulls out this bottle of this bottle of brandy. And he said, yeah, if you want a swig of brandy, have a swig of brandy. I didn't like brandy. You know, if you'd have brought out a Caffrey's or something, or a Guinness, I might have been <laughs> But some of the lads had a swig of brandy, and that was the, men- that was the mentality in chamber. It was like, look, this is it. Do whatever you've got to do to get yourself in the right frame of mind. Um, and then we're into the game. You've got 10,000 Cumbrians in the stadium, and then the game kicks off. It was a, it was a nothing game in terms of quality. You know, it wasn't, there wasn't, Plymouth literally were just going through the motions to a certain degree. Nil-nil, uh, half-time. I made like, a couple of little saves, took some crosses, pinged some some balls, you know. Did not really much about the first half, except for at the end of the first half, Paul Gibbs, who I later played with at Brentford, he broke his leg. Uh, Tony Hopper, one of the Car- Carlisle players at the time, he accidentally crunched him and broke his leg. And it, it kind of took quite a few minutes for it to... To um to be sorted out, right. and the referee added on the time, not a half time because they were trying to get give off the pitch, but to yeah, the end of the game. game. So suddenly we were behind the Scarborough game by about five minutes. You know, so Scarborough then come out second half, kicked off five minutes before we did, which which ultimately eventually was was important because it meant that second half Plymouth uh, Lee Phillips picks up the ball. His own half runs around about five or six players, gets the edge of the box, smacks in the bottom corner. Like it's just stone silence, the whole stadium. Like Carlisle struggled to score all season. They weren't a team that was in form. Did you do anything about the goal? No, no, I'm sure I'm sure Mel Major would have blamed me or Jimmy. Yeah. <laughs> I remember Sue Ness saying as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 Ask questions <laughs> to the keeper. <laughs> he just stood over and went, 
Fucking you know great what? finish that. It was, <laughs> it's a great it was finish. Good goal, good strike, for a set of legs, bottom corner, well hit. Um and you're like you know, the, you could feel the fans, you could feel the, the stadium just starting to sort of the the tension and the fear. You could feel it. And then um the crowd were quite subdued. Sixty two <laughs> minutes. David Brightwell, he 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 gets on the end of a, a loose ball about twenty five yards out and scores what he calls a weldy. Right? It was a weldy. It was actually a bobbly sort of miss it. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> Sorry, Bray, it wasn't it? It was a weldy, mate. Into the bottom corner, past James Dungy in a goal, and it's 1-1. And now, and the the crowd in this process have sort of told us that, that Peterborough had scored at Scarborough because they're starting to get buzzy. And then Peterborough had equalised, and it was 1-1. And now we're at 1-1. And essentially, we have to we have to score, and and this takes us all the way into the like the ninetieth minute. The Scarborough game had finished one one. Guy called Colin Carter who was on the Tannoy that day. Starts shouting down the Tannoy, giving the score out and saying, "Come on, Carl. you know the, the the league breaking all league rules." I think. And <laughs> Then you're allowed to shout down the tunnel. <laughs> 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 you know, and uh, and it just comes down to the last. The, the injury time. And do you think that does pick the players up a bit? Because I think like one of the things he says is, we've got four minutes to save our football club mm. over the tannoy. What he said? Yeah, basically. I think yeah, of course it does. He's gonna, he's gonna, you're gonna. But then I think in reality the boys played better second half and had a go. It just wasn't working for them. They had a couple of misses and the keeper made a couple of saves. And but you could feel the apprehension and the, and the fear of the crowd. You feel they're thinking this is it really. You know, we're sort of going down. And then it just comes down literally to a pump a long ball forward. Someone goes wide, ricochets off a defender, goes out for a corner. Now, I think at this point, because, again, I don't pay a lot of attention, you've you probably realised, <laughs> I think there's a couple of minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> I don't know why. I think there's a couple of minutes left. You know, I just I, I don't know why. And then, um, so I'm looking over at night, thinking, should I go up? You know, and he's like, "Yeah, just go up." And I'm sort of halfway anyway, because you know you've already worked out. I like the glory. Nigel's in his bottle of brandy. There's, <laughs> a yeah, There's a goal here. I'm thinking. Um, so I just run up the pitch, and it turns out it transpires that the referee says the Brights on the way, and this is it. There's like ten seconds. This is it. There's literally this is it. You got this is your last kick. And uh, and I'm running up and. and you always think when you run up, and I've done it before. I try to go up for corners and stuff, and you get some idiot take the corner when you're on the when you're halfway between the penalty spot and the box, and you think, you know, you thought you'd wait. You thought you'd wait. You know, with for whatever reason, I think it was uh, Graham Ant, he, he waited, and, and I've just arrived in the box, and uh, the corner's coming. Great header from Scott Doby, but straight at the keeper, and James Dungy go, he just parried it, and. And I literally, like I say, you're going to think, I mean, your strikers, you're going to think I'm full of it. But whenever I dropped a cross or I made a mistake, there would always be someone stood right in the middle of the six-yard box just tapping it in. And over the years, I'm not the most skillful footballer in the world and I'm not the most gifted. But for whatever reason, I always worked out where the ball was going to land and where there was a goal. And that's, that's why I always scored the goals because I always worked out you see things and, you know, it's like strikers. Some strikers see things easier than others and they anticipate a bit better and they can work out. And I think just my years of playing in goal and getting beaten by shots and stuff, you work out where something's good. And I saw Scott Doby head it and I just thought, right, well, if I'm not making the first one, I'm going to go in the middle of the six-yard box. And literally, I get to the middle of the six-yard box and I'm the only person there. You know, and the keeper makes a parry and it just drops to me. And literally, it couldn't have dropped on my right foot any more perfect. And I'm in the middle of a six-yard box. There's no one around me. And I literally just volleyed it into the bottom corner. And and the, the irony is, you know, you'd think you score a goal as a goalie. You know, you'd think that you'd be like flabbergasted or you'd think, you know. And even in that circumstance, you'd think... <laughs> You know, this is like, um, but I just expected it. <laughs> 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 I don't, just for a minute, I thought, well, that's natural. 
then I'll try to laugh in there like this. <laughs> you know, and then I think, I've just scored, I get to celebrate now. <laughs> and I went to turn, like, and the hand went up and I went to celebrate. And you, you always think if you're going to score enough. Listen, I've tried to score in games before league games. I remember trying to lob Chris Woods from about 70 yards once and just <laughs> missing the top corner by about a foot, you know. And you always think, what would you do if you scored? And you think, oh, you'd run off and you'd, you'd run down the line and, you know, you'd put your hand in the air. And I literally turned, put my hand up and then got absolutely smacked from all the players from different angles and, and jumped on. And then we hit the ground. And I remember saying, Bryce, the score, Bryce. He went, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and like we're cuddling each other on the we're cuddling each other on the ground, but then this fucking pile started getting heavier and heavier and heavier, <laughs> and I'm laying there and I got around Bright, so he's around me, and we're like we can't breathe, and because there was a there was a pitch invasion obviously, and the fans are on there and they're on in their thousands. Looks dangerous that pile on. <laughs> well, we, we we couldn't breathe. <laughs> I kid you not, we couldn't breathe, and we're down there for a good minute, and we're like struggling to breathe, and I'm thinking, fucking hell, get off, get off. And I can't go in an MRI scanner now because I think I've got claustrophobia. <laughs> Seriously, I never had it before. <laughs> <laughs> You've not been in a confined space since. <laughs> I never had it before. And I've got up and I've got a nose bleed. I think someone must have punched me in the face or something. And I'm th- like, my nose is bleeding. I'm trying to run through the. So I'm crying now because I'm laughing. I'm trying to run through the crowd because then there's, there's like 10,000 people on the pitch or whatever. And um, and I'm thinking, through all this, right, my heart's pumping out my chest, as you'd imagine. I'm thinking, right, calm the fuck down. You've got two minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> I'm literally thinking, there's two minutes left of the game. And my heart, I could barely breathe. My heart's pumping out my chest. You've got, got a nose bleed. I go back to my goal, I get my towel, someone's nicked it. You know, I'm like, right, okay, wipe my nose, and I'm like, no, I'm like right, focus, focus. Because obviously, you can imagine that you score goals, you, you know what it's like. You're just scoring a goal, you know what it's like. The elation you get. And, the, and from, from sheer misery in the stadium, and one of the things I always remember about this, and one of the things that, that sticks with me, sheer misery and heartache and pain and frustration and, and anger in the stadium, in that second, just turned to elation. 10,000 people, just pure elation, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a heartbeat. And that's fucking coming out my chest. Yeah. yeah. So I'm trying to get back to my goal thinking, calm down, calm down, calm down. Because, like, you know, you think, oh, right, okay, the heart's pumping out of your chest, you're going a bit dizzy, and they break down a right wing whip across you, and you come out of <laughs> <laughs> And what I didn't notice is the referee, like their goalie, um, was in the penalty, he was in the center circle. So the referee had told him, right, get to because this is it. Now, me, completely unaware as usual. I'm the furthest one away from the tunnel at this point. <laughs> and I'm the one they all want. And he literally rolls the ball for, blows the whistle, and that's it. They just pick the ball up and they run off the pitch. Did they get everybody off the pitch to do the kick to kick off again? Yeah, they got everyone off the pitch, to, but they're obviously on the sides and they're, you know, it's all, they're just waiting to go. They're, they're, on, they're in the blocks. And I'm ready completely for that. unaware that I'm the furthest one away from the tunnel. He still thinks there's two minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take a kick off for your lunch. Yeah. <laughs> and he blows the whistle and then and then um Everyone runs off or tries to run off, and I got halfway across the pitch, and then they just hit me from all angles of fans. There's a party there. I'm going to sort this in, actually. Well, I just, you know, when you're, you know, when, you, um, when you're involved in a, 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 that sort of situation in sport, you know, it's, it's just surreal. You know, I'm not Bobby Moore winning the World Cup, you know, but in that moment, in that arena... With those fans that love well, their club so much. To them, it fans. was the World Cup, though, yeah. Well, it, it? Well, yeah. it was. And then in reality, that's why it's lived on for 22, 23 years in the, in the, in the parts of Carlisle fans. That's why they love it so much, you know? By the way, I'd be very surprised if the ref didn't have concussion. Did you see him get pulled out? Oh. Yeah, he did. Fans ran on and just took him out. Yeah, he did. Jumped on him. Out, yeah. took they were him bouncing the floor. on the crossbar, weren't they? They were bouncing on the crossbar. And it was just it was just an unbelievable it was an unbelievable atmosphere and like I say being carried off the football pitch in that moment um, and I've got to be honest now I'd, you know I'd gone like I say I was injured at Palace and and 
and that didn't work out well for me. And I went to Bournemouth and that didn't work out well for me. And I'd gone to Swindon and that didn't work out well for me. Jimmy, I'm, I know for a fact Jimmy Coon sent me up to Carlisle to fail, you know. But then to come for that to happen, it was just, it was just obviously the greatest moment of my career. Because you'll think he's thought, they're going to go down. I'll send him there and I can use that as an excuse next year. Yeah, maybe, yeah. I'll just... just you took fucking Carl Al down, you Yeah, basically, yeah. Just get rid of me, whatever. You know, go, go and fail. But it was, it was just, you know, that day, it was, it was just surreal. And then afterwards, obviously, you know, I dealt with media before, but not to that extent. You know, suddenly everyone wants to talk to me. And and uh, and the next day, um, Brian Burrows, who was, who was our um, captain at Swindon, because that, that's my loan over. And that night, you know, well, actually that night, to be fair, I went back to the hotel after the game. I, I got caught doing loads of media stuff. And by the time I got back to the change room, everyone had fucked off. <laughs> the YTS boys are sweeping the change room. <laughs> There's a load of boys start turning up that have got a, that have hired the pitch out for like a corporate thing afterwards. So I'm still getting changed in the change room. And lads are coming in that are just planned on a pitch after the game. Because they've, they've probably made, I don't know, 250 quid renting a pitch. 1.3 million and 250 you know? quid is, man. <laughs> so I'm like, what's, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's that's happening. I'm supposed had, you got, to, had you got any plans well, I'm supposed to be either going way? Back, I'm supposed to be going back to Nottingham to see my girlfriend. She was in Nottingham. So I was going to drive through, stay in Nottingham that night and see my girlfriend. So obviously I phoned her and went... I might stay up tonight, love. Is that all right? <laughs> <laughs> you know? But I didn't know where they're going. It turns out one of the YT boys said, I think they're going to Leonardo's, which was a, a nightclub restaurant place. So I went back to the hotel. had a shit. I like, got changed, you know. I'm talking to my mum on the phone. And she's like, oh, my mum and dad were watching it on Sky. And it was a great moment for them, obviously. You know, um, My dad especially. Because my dad was always pretty scared whenever I pulled a pair of gloves on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where I've got my <laughs> insecurities and lack of belief from. <laughs> but not from a point of view he didn't believe in me as a player. He just he knew the pressure that was in entailed and stuff. And and when you're trying to build a career, you, you know, the, the ups and downs I had. The thing is, you had, this, you had the lack of belief, when it, but when it came to scoring goals, you were full of belief, weren't you? The irony of me is a, the irony of me, and I probably, in all honesty, there were times in my career where I probably should, could have switched. No, I could have switched and gone and played up front, even if it had been league and I wouldn't, I wouldn't have had a, an ounce of doubt in me. The irony of being a goalie, professional goalie, was where I doubted myself. But on pitch, I, and even, listen, even, even when I come back into football, you know, with Ed and we have staff games, I still go on and score two or three goals. <laughs> you know, I'm like 40, 45 and Fletcher's at the back centre half, he, you know, because he knows he can't score. No, but it, it just, it has. It's just something that's always, I've just always had a belief that I'll score goals. Did you, you know when you were doing interviews after? Did you have to correct the journalist? Like, no, no, I'm a natural born goal scorer. <laughs> <laughs> That's meat, meat and drink for Jimbo. <laughs> <laughs> I've done a few over the years. I've got, oh yeah. Goalies always seem to all frustrate the strikers. I went, no, I'm actually a striker. <laughs> I think they just got it wrong. <laughs> After 13 years, I think maybe someone wrote it wrong on the paperwork when I signed as YTS. <laughs> but listen, yeah. it is funny, but you're right. You're actually, you're absolutely spot on. You know the belief I had in scoring, and maybe I'm maybe I'm crazy. Maybe it's just a you know a irrational belief, but for one reason or another. And this is the ir the irony of of scoring a goal for Carlisle. I never really, if I'm truly honest, it took me years to work this out. I never really truly gave football my all. I loved it, but I never worked hard enough. I didn't find that coach. I didn't work on my physical aspects enough. It was all very natural to me to play in goal. So I, I worked off natural ability. And ultimately, like I said, eventually, when you get to a certain age, you need to be the finished product. And maybe that's why I wasn't good enough in the end. I think there are other reasons, going back to the coaching, lack of coaching and stuff. But I think ultimately, I never truly worked hard enough or understood what you had to do to be a footballer. Because I found it easy to a certain degree. Um, that sounds brash. But you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I was a natural player and I just went off natural ability. Yeah. And I think ultimately, eventually, if you don't show football the respect it deserves, the career, the respect it deserves, if you don't work hard enough, you don't put the effort in, in the gym, if you don't eat properly, if you don't, if you don't work out your own technical deficiencies and work on them, then 
you don't deserve to have a, a long career and be successful. There are people to get away with it, but not many, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Someone's put their hand up. Let me tell which one, let me tell which one it was. But you're not gonna, you're not gonna have that career. I didn't realize that when I was young. Later in my taxi, working out my issues, working out how I felt, I realized that's what happened. But I do think football, it knew how much I loved it, and I think it knew where I was comfortable. And the irony of me actually, eventually. The one thing really I did in my football career, which gave me the fame or whatever of scoring a goal, being a goalkeeper that scored a goal, it, for me, it's actually, it, there's irony there. And it's probably, you know, like I say, I'm not spiritual. I, I don't believe in too many higher powers, but there was something about it which has always sat with me and just thought, yeah, well, that was that, that's what I deserved. Mm-hmm. I deserved that moment. It's VPN time, Chrissy. It is VPN time. A quick word from our sponsor for this week's episode. Nord VPN. We've spoken about it before, haven't we, John? We certainly have, and hey. I've been watching with. Uh, I've been watching loads of games. For those of you who don't know, it's the tool that encrypts all your internet traffic and hides your uh, location. We're not. So we're not. It's a good tool as well, that, isn't it? Oh yeah, depending, especially if you don't want people to know where you are. Well, it, it <laughs> significantly boosts your uh, internet security, so you don't need to. You know, like when you went cafe. And you use their internet. You, you don't know what you're doing. Anybody can yeah. anybody can get in and nick your passwords and all that. But if you're using a VPN, no, no, no. It's like you a bouncer at the door. It's like a bouncer at the door. I'll be honest with you. Baldy bouncer. But like we said, it, it bounces your location as well. So if there's, say, a football game that you want to watch, which has been shown in a different country, you can uh, you can project to your location as Costa Rica, let's say. <laughs> oh. Yeah, well, can you get bit, the American Netflix as well Netflix. or something? Yeah, you can get the American Netflix. You can get the Argentine Netflix if you want. If they've got a show that you want. Yeah, I've got some you, I know you like your Argentine <laughs> dramas, right? So you can... You can... The, the, the Argentine cracker. Oh, it's honestly it's a fantastic watch. <laughs> but you can bounce your look at, like you said, if there's a game being shown in Argentina and you want to watch that game, maybe it's Crystal Palace versus QPR. In a cup tie. That's a big a, Argentinian fixture, that. They might be showing it in, in Argentina and you want to watch it. Well, you can bounce your location to Argentina, sat on the beach with a pina colada watching the Eagles. And as always, we've got a bit of an offer. We've got a, a link in the description on the audio and the video. Um, if you click on it, you'll get a, a hefty discount if you sign up. Can't be fairer than that, Chris. No. Mm. NordVPN. No. The link's in the description. If... I could take away that self-doubt that you'd spoke about throughout your career and give you a steady as she goes, playing constantly, let's say Premier League, mid-table, but take away that moment. Where are we going? What a great question. Well done, Chris. Well done, you. (laughs) 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 But that is a million-dollar question, isn't it? It's, It's the one that probably... That's the one that oh, I, I that always plagues me. Do you would you go would you change your life? Would you change where you are now for for, for more money, essentially? Mm-hmm. Um and I've always felt that players and I've always had this sort of struggle with football. It's why I stayed away for quite a long time. I've always felt that people didn't really players within the game, ones that I actually respected, didn't really respect the fact that I scored this goal. Because to, to score one goal and to fucking for it to be in the hundred great sporting moments and to to people still want to talk about it twenty three years later, so I was sat here, you know. No, I would have had you anyway, mate, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> we like taxi drivers. <laughs> um, you know, it's one of them things where that's all I did and, and then it gave me sort of a great platform to a certain degree. It didn't, it didn't make me any money, I've got to tell you, it made me no money whatsoever scoring a goal. So even straight after scoring a goal, like Michael Knight and wanted to sign me at, at at Carlisle, but didn't want to pay the 800 quid a week and my 10 grand sign on fee I asked for. I just saved him millions of pounds, you know, but didn't want to pay me 800 quid a week and 10 grand sign on fee, well, <coughs> with which, I, which I wanted to drop down two leagues, you know. I probably still wouldn't have been the top earner at Carlisle. You know, I wasn't asking for more money mm. than what they were paying other people, you know. 
But it is, it's a funny thing because I always feel pe the people in football don't really respect the goal. And, and if they know me, like Ed, Eddie Howe, he used to love it. He used to joke about it all the time. Whenever we sign a new player, he'd say, right, now you've got to go and sit in a room with Jimmy for three hours and he's going to talk you through his goal. <laughs> 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 you know? um, so, but to people that knew me personally, but everyone else I always got a bit of a, a feeling from that they were thinking, ah, oh, fucking hell, one goal, you know, all that attention, one goal. And that left me a little bit agitated at times. So would I change it? Uh, I, no. No. In the same way, you know, you can have marriages and divorces in your life and would you go, well, would I change it? No, you end up with your kids and your life and you are who you are because of, of what you've done in your life. And and has it, you know, has, has fallen out of football and that hurt me? It has, yeah, because I love football and I wanted to be a footballer. Did I work hard enough? No, I've explained that. You know, but would I change scoring a goal for a, a, a Premier League career? I've had to struggle for money. I've had to drive my taxi, worry about the gas bill. You know, years of, of gambling and struggling. So money and me's never. I've never had loads of money, and I've always had to go and work. And like I said, football, the goal has never made me any money. But the beauty of it, you know, in your life, if you've got even just one moment that you can look back on and your kids can look back on and you can, and it brings joy and you can bring joy to yourself and stuff like that, you know? Ultimately, what what we what do we leave with us when we go? It's a bit morbid, this. But what do we leave? We leave memories. That's all, that's all we actually leave to people. If you're lucky, if you're an old old son, you might have 500 million, but that's not <laughs> going to get you very far, is it? <laughs> you know, ultimately, you leave memories to your family and your friends and the people that loved you. And, and you know, and I think... A mediocre career in a Premier League, yep, yeah, fine. Would I be richer? Would I be more comfortable financially? Definitely. But would I swap it for that goal? I don't think I would. I just love, I love the poetry that was involved with a goal. I love the moment, and that's what I love so much about football. That it can yeah. give you them moments because it gives you those moments. And football is the is is the most beautiful game. I'm not trying to nick Palais' words, but it's the most beautiful game, and it gives people so much joy and love. And it gives them something to focus on and follow their teams and show passion about and to be involved in football. And in the end, that just it just had one moment, but a moment that that, that is there forever, probably. It's, yeah, I, I wouldn't swap it, no. Even watching it now, it still gives us goose pimples because the, the commentator was brilliant, wasn't he? Mm. The enthusiasm he had and, like yeah, you said, 23 yeah. years later. Have you ever bought a drink in Carlisle since? Um, No. No. You get to move how you are before you moving up. But this is the yeah, thing, see, and this is this is the thing, and you're you, you're right. Over the years, the first couple of years, I'd go back, and I remember two or three months after, I got invited to the mayor making ceremony. And Carl Howard took my dad up with me, you know, and um, and Michael Knight had never come through on his promise of a contract for me, so that I had to lower my wage demands. So I went with my dad back to the mayor making ceremony, and um, we sat in the chambers and. And uh, some fella come up to me, he said, you know, he said, they're thinking that they want to make, maybe make you a free man of the city. <laughs> uh, and I, I went, oh, right. I said, what does that mean? And apparently you can run your sheep over the bridge. Do <laughs> <laughs> right. you like this sheep? I would have bought some sheep. <laughs> I'm 25 years old now. I'm 25 years old and someone said, they're going to make you a man of the city. And I don't know how to take this. I'm like, all right. And then from behind me, and I forget, this little voice piped up. You know, it went quiet. He went, you got to do more than that to get freedom of this fucking city, son. <laughs> <laughs> you know, straight away, put straight back in your place by some little farmer. <laughs> been sat there for 20 years just to, just to eat the cucumber sandwiches. You're not bringing your sheep but over they, um, on a patch. But what I did was I took I know, another couple of months later, I got another phone call and they, they took... When I went up there, I literally went up, I had a pair of Adidas Predator blades, no good for a goalkeeper, but I said I was a forward. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know I didn't have, I didn't have any, some good curl on them goal kicks. <laughs> I didn't have any, I was no good for matches, but unbelievable in training. <laughs> But uh, so I had no boots. I went down to like Chivers Sports um, in in Carlisle, like old sports shop in there. And I went in and I didn't have much, but I had this pair. They had one pair left, size 10 and a half. I was about a 10, but I'd take a 10 and a half. Puma SBA Kings. And I always wanted a pair of Puma SBA Kings and they were beautiful. And 
little foldy tongue and had a little step in them. And I bought them and I ended up playing the three games in these Puma SBA Kings, boots I'd always wanted. Obviously, at the end of the season, I hung them up and then the, the council asked if they could have the boots. And I'm like, what do you want the boots for? We want to make a bronze car statue of your right foot. And at the time, they were, they were building a millennium wall in the town because it's 99. And they basically can't, like, they cast my right foot, my right, right boot, in, and they put it on this wall. So in the middle of the, this millennium wall in the middle of Carlisle is this bronze cast thing in my right foot. Do you think the fact that you, you couldn't come to an agreement on signing for Carlisle kind of plays into the, the legend a little bit? The fact that Jimmy Glass, he turned up three games, scored the goal that kept him alive. And then fucked off. Miss, and then miss fu- bath boss and then yeah. just fucked off. Well, I think, you know, what, going back to what you just said about buying a beer in Carlisle, one of the things I've tried to do is not go there too much. He's really? not. He's not go there and live it up and yeah. and and take the piss because eventually they will go. Oh, he's here again for another Guinness. Yeah. yeah, you know. And 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 what you just said is is I think is spot on. Had I gone to and I was desperate to play, I just wanted to play and to go to Carlisle after I'd done that. Obviously, would have been <clears> a hero and it would, have, would have been greatly received and brilliant. But had I then gone and not done well, it would have took the shine off of the the, the, the what I'd achieved. Now, I think that they would always have loved me, but it still would have took the shine off of what I achieved. So mm. definitely, in some ways, Michael Knight had done me a favour. Um, and I thought about that many years later as well. I realised he actually done me a favour. Mm. If we speak about the couple of months after, obviously you're on cloud nine in May. You've got the summer where you're probably still on cloud nine. And then it must have come to a point where you thought, I need to find a club here. Well, no, because I, I was still at Swindon. I had three years left at Swindon. Oh, for five. I had three years left of my contract at Swindon. So I'd gone there... It, it was weird, you know, that summer, no one come in. He, you would have thought someone would want a goal-scoring goalie, wouldn't they? <laughs> <laughs> you know? They're a dying was, breed. You know, <laughs> you, know you, you thought someone would have, but it just didn't. And but you've, still that, got that, you've still got that security in your head that I've still got three years left on my contract. I'm not, I'm not out of work. No, mm. well, that's what you, you decide to do. And I'm like, okay, I'll roll my sleeves up and I'll get stuck in and try and win my place at Swindon. But, but like I say, that year for me, it just got worse and worse. You know, Jimmy Quinn, was the team was struggling in their bottom of the league. Hence why before the end of that season, I tore up my contract and 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 left. Because once Jimmy Quinn had then, you know, I played a few games, and then, but then once he'd thrown me to the walls, I, I was just, I was out. So I went to Cambridge and went finally wanted to sign me and he had this, he had, I think it was a Dutch goalie that he had. He said, look, I've just got to get rid of this goalie. I've got to get rid of him. And he couldn't get rid of him. And uh, and that I eventually didn't sign for Cambridge, and I and then in the summer I was looking for a club again, and I went down. And I got a call from Exeter, and I can't remember who was a manager now, but I got, got a call from Exeter. Do you want to come down? And I played against them in a friendly for Crawley, and they said, oh, "Do you want to come down? We want to, you know, want to look at you." Okay, fine. So I drove through about four counties to get to Exeter, and they were playing Wimbledon that night in a friendly. But as I literally, I drove through four counties, and I'm playing that night keen to play and as I as I drove in the car park out of the office just signed was the Dutch goalie that Roy McFarlane had been trying to get rid of the <laughs> <laughs> oh fucking hell <laughs> you know like, I literally I, I got back in my car I said have you just signed and he went yeah 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 I went I'm going to go home mate and I drove back through four counties back to, back to Surrey <laughs> about the goal but because you talked about the brilliance of the, the poetry and the moment and the memory of it. Was there ever a point as as we were moving through clubs that you had any resentment towards the moment? Yeah. Because de- in definitely. reflection now you can see it, but did you feel like that you weren't being taken serious? Yeah, as a And if you read, if you, if, you, if you look at the book, okay, I'm not plugging this book, I don't think you can buy it anymore, so it's not a problem. <laughs> but it was, it, it felt like an albatross. For a period of time, yeah. it felt like an albatross around my neck. It felt like it was stopping. It was actually stopping me from from moving on. Because at that point, like I tried to explain, managers didn't want goal scoring goalkeepers. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, "Yeah, just getting goal sharp." Um, so yeah, so for a long time, the goal, the kind of circus that surrounded the goal, added to my theatrical nature as a goalkeeper. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it did. It was like an albatross. And 20 minutes in, 1 0 down. I'm going up, Gaffer. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> it's, the problem is, I've probably had more shots on target than most of our forwards at the time. Yeah. 
But it is. It was an albatross. It felt like an albatross. Now, now, obviously, on reflection, like you say, years later to think about it, I realise that it wasn't. It was my shortcomings. I should have done better. You know, I should have been more professional and I should have understand, understood my psychology better, you know. But I didn't. I was naive. I, don't, I, don't, I, think, I think you're being a little bit uh, harsh and critical of yourself when you're saying, I should have understood my psychology better. No, you're right. Of course you're right. You know, we, we all look back at our lives and go, okay, but... But ultimately, if you're going to find a reason for something, you have to be brutal. If you really want to understand your psychology in life and you really want to stay in where and be where you should have done something, but you didn't, you have to be brutal. And you have to go, okay, well, actually, I should have done that. Now, I didn't. Am I going to harbour on it? Am I going to resent it? Am I going to let it get me down? No. But one of the differences it made to me when I went back into football at AFC Bournemouth... Even in my role as player liaison, which was more of a role of organising everything, orchestrating everything off the pitch. One of the things I worked out sat in my taxi for 13 years was if I ever get a chance again, if I ever get a chance again to get back into football, there's not many people could drop as far away from football as I have mm. and come back into it at the level that I did with, with listen, player liaison at Bournemouth, but, you know, in truth, I was training. I still had my gloves on. I was out there diving around in goal. Well, pretty oh, much. Not, not, not like you in training. I was playing up front as well, obviously. But <laughs> <laughs> Callum, out, of, out of the office, Callum. No, listen, You're some, on the right wing. Listen, I had some great chats with Jay, Jermaine Defoe, you know, because he's more the, the kind of ilk of goal scorer that I understand. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I see this is very similar. Do you feel better when you stepped away from football? Um... When you decided to knock on the head. We, 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 like when you, obviously, you finished at 27, 28. Mm. And we're, obviously, we are, we are gambling and all that sort of stuff. Are you? I went to, my last club was Oxford United in terms of pro club. I was there about six months. Dennis Smith signed me, lovely guy. But he was on his way out. And then Joe Kinnear come in with David Kemp. And David Kemp, I worked with at, at Palace, knew very well. I think I had Kemp. Is it, Tony Pulis. Yeah. Assistant manager, yeah, Kempe. Yeah, 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 yeah. I had Kempe. Yeah, well, Kempe, I knew Kempe. Kempe was a Wimbledon youth team manager when I was a Palace youth team and, and then come to Palace. And the irony was Kempe knew me really well because what he did at Oxford is I was on the bench, so I'd be sat on a bench and he asked the kit man to make up two shirts for me. I had an outfield shirt as well. <laughs> 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 I had an outfield shirt. I had whatever my number was as, as a, a, a goalie shirt and also I had an outfield shirt. Never had, did he get used? No, oh. never got used. I, I think, to be fair, I, if I'm truly honest, I wasn't, by that stage, I probably, I'd probably i gone, I think, mentally anyway. I probably wasn't the goalie I was when he first saw me at Palace, can't be. So, to be fair to him. Although he did get me a downfield shirt made up, which means I obviously was a, just, I was still the striker. <laughs> 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 that was plenty of my next, but it's half a chance of coming on a pub from. Um, so, but basically, it just what Oxford. I was on month to month. I was driving from from London, my dad's mum dad's house to Oxford every day, pretty much. And I was it was the the, the love and desire to do it anymore was literally, literally slowly seeping out of me. And then Kempi come in, and I thought I might have a chance, but I didn't really, joking here. And then I just remember waking up one day, and they'd signed Lee Cutler. Um, was no Lee Butler. They signed him alone, and I'm like, that's it, I'm done. And I woke up one morning, I remember waking up one morning at home, and I just, I phoned Kempi, I said, I'm not coming in, Dave, I'm done. And that was when I gave up, and I literally just walked away from football. Um, was there a relief? Yeah, there was, because it just had been painful if I'm, in many ways. I'm, now, I'm talking relative, I'm not talking like some people's pain in this world, but yeah. when you've done something from the age of 15 and you, you, you keep banging, you feel like you keep banging your head against the wall, even though you've got on one end, you've got this, this goal, you know, but on the other end, you, you're trying to build a career and it just ain't happening. It was like a real strange scenario. It was, it was, <coughs> it's a real strange place to be in mentally. And I think in the end, it just tied me out. What did I have? I'd literally, I'd never worked since I left school. I was 15, went straight into Palace, never worked, didn't have any money. And not just because I gambled low, but I didn't really have a lot of money. I didn't never earned a lot of money. Um, and I was in the real world. It was like, what am I going to do? And I had, had met a, a girl, funny enough, about about a month after I signed. Um, sorry, after I scored for Carlo, I met a girl on a beach in Cyprus. Um, 
fortunate and she was good looking as well. It was only <laughs> on the basis I'd score for Carlisle. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love Nice to meet Jimmy Glass, Carlisle. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was. Yeah, you'll do. And, um, <laughs> I've seen the goal. I'll just... Uh... <laughs> but to be fair, one of my mates reenacted it on a beach in front of her when I pulled her, so I see that, uh... <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't say that. That's, that's, that's... But anyway, so we, 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 we were together and then... And then not long after I, I, I quit football, I, she literally fell pregnant with twins. And then so, so I got no job. <laughs> that 20 grand in debt, um, uh, no house, because I hadn't really settled anywhere. And I've got twins on the way. So, um, and in a good old way, I'm like, yep, come on then, let's get on with it. And I had to go and find a life. And I had literally had to go into the real world and get a job. And I went to work for an IT company. When you've got twins on the way and you've got to suddenly start earning money, you've got to do whatever you got to do. ASAP. It is, yeah. You haven't got time to go, oh, what's that? Oh, I'll go to uni for a couple yeah, of years yeah, and I'll yeah. do this. And I just had to get stuck <clears throat> into the real world. And that was it and settled into family life. Now, I was still carrying this gambling habit. Like I say, I wasn't some degenerate gambler. It wasn't saying I did every every day or it wasn't saying I'd go and spunk my money on, but it was, in the, it was on the back burner. And it was, it was a struggle. And it was a struggle, if I'm honest. It was a struggle for probably for up until I went back into Bournemouth probably seven years ago. And when I say I struggle, I eventually ended up owning a taxi company. And, and, and then before I went back to Bournemouth, I'd quit gambling and, and worked on that and worked on a bit of psychology and straightened myself out. Hence why I felt capable of going back into football because I was still carrying for years this resentment of football, sat in my taxi which come out in that book, like I said. But I'd started to straighten myself out and clear my brain and start to look forward and then and watching what Ed was doing at Bournemouth and wanting to be involved with that and then found a niche in football that I could fulfil, which I thought I'd be really good at, play liaison, you know, after making every mistake in football like you don't want to make, you know, to be able to go in and, and help footballers, hopefully, not from a psychological point of view because they have people for that, but a more an understanding point of view. Is you that know? why you got the job, Mentoring. Did you have that initial conversation with Eddie Howe? I what did, was the... that's, that's exactly right. I, well, I went, first of all, I went back, basically I got invited back one day by a friend to go into the hospitality lounge and watch a Blackburn Rovers game. The year they got promoted to the Premier League. So I've gone to the game and I've got, got like jacket on and stuff and, and I hadn't been back to Bournemouth for ages. But I'll tell you what happened first. I've walked in, I've sat down, I'm in the hospitality, nice bit of dinner, wonderful. The guy on the microphone comes in, you know, Dave Fitzgerald, his name was. Nice guy, Dave, actually. But he says, oh, we've got an ex-player in the room today. And I'm thinking, oh, no. Thinking, I don't really want to, you know, I just, because I played like 130 games for Bournemouth. I played at Wembley for Bournemouth, you know, but it's fine. But I don't really, I wasn't comfortable enough to want to stand up and start talking about stuff. I just wanted to go there, watch the game. And David Stocks, we've got David Stocks <laughs> over in the corner. <laughs> You know, <laughs> David, stand up, David. <laughs> David, you know, for the greatest bits in the world, they've got someone that's in the 100 greatest sporting moments that played 130 games with the club in the room as well, and no one even fucking knew. <laughs> and it's a party then after he's done that thinking. Well, there's, part <laughs> yeah, no, there's a part of me thinking, okay, it's all right, all right, okay, fine. That's funny. I saw the funny side of it. Like, I saw the funny side of it because I'm not, I, I'm not some egotistical fucking maniac I don't I saw the funny side of it you know but then the, the person who invited us then starts shouting across the room we've got Jimmy Glass <laughs> Jimmy Glass and he's, he's on the mic who? Jimmy who? <laughs> and now I'm sat in my chair and I'm thinking oh please swallow me up and just take me outside <laughs> you know and I just thought for whatever reason it just football with me just didn't seem to work <laughs> you know I just come to like watch the game and have a bit of chicken. I, you know, I didn't want really to be embarrassed. I don't want some guy shouting, called, "Jimmy, who? Jim, Jimmy, who? <laughs> <laughs> what?" <laughs> anyway, and then he comes over the table and oh, Jimmy Glass, oh, Jimmy Glass. I went, "No, it's gone now, mate. It's gone." <laughs> I'm like, just leave me in there. It's gone. Just let it go. Let me eat with, let me eat with my meringue. Just leave me alone. <laughs> You know, we watched the game, listen, and, and they drew 1-1. One, one. And then the following Wednesday, funny enough, Matt Latizier was doing a gentleman's evening at the club. And then this friend invited us again and we went down and we went, okay. 
And bear in mind, whenever I went, if I went to a football match on a Saturday, it cost me 300 quid for not working. So in the taxi, that's when I earn my money. So my wife and I at the time sort of said, look, should we do it? You know, should we go back in? For whatever reason, we went back in. And I had no intention at this point of getting back into football. I didn't see it in any way, shape or form. I had a taxi business. I'm trying to pay the bills. I'm trying to work out what's going on. And then the following Wednesday, we speak to Rob Mitchell, the, the, the commercial manager, and he came up to me and said, oh, when I spoke to you the other day, I didn't realise you played for the club. You know, I didn't realise you played at Wembley and stuff for the club. <laughs> 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 130 games for the club at Wembley. Didn't realise. <laughs> And I went, no, that's right, yeah. This, yeah you know. <laughs> and he said, what do you think of the club now? I said, well, it's amazing. You know, he said, you know, it's amazing. He said, what do you think of hospitality? And I said, well, it, it's, it's sensational. I said, it, although, and I don't know why I said this, and it wasn't a dig at poor Dave Fitzgerald. I said, but at the big clubs, they get ex-players doing the, the hosting, you know, in the room, because it's quite a big room, it's 200 people. And they, he said, yeah, we've always wanted that. He said, but we'd never, never really found anyone to do it. He said, would you consider it? And I just said to him, yeah, okay, because I'd never done hosting, but I'd done lots of media stuff because of the goal. I'd done lots of media stuff, stuff like this. I've sat and talked about it constantly, as you can probably tell. <laughs> you know, and, and I said, yeah, I'll give it a go anyway. So a few weeks later, he, he phones me. And I don't know why I said I'll do it, but a few weeks later, he phones me. He said, look, this lad can't do the Birmingham game. Can you do the Birmingham game? And I went, yeah, okay. So I went and hosted the hospitality suite. And this is the first, that's the first step back into basically football. I was so far out of football, I can't even tell you. And then my first step back into Bournemouth was hosting the hospitality suite. And then that went really well. And, he, and I got a call I know, a few weeks close to the end of the season when they looked like they were getting promoted. He said, look, if we go up next year in the Premier League, we want you to do it every game. Would you consider doing every game? And at that point, it was like, a, it was like something changed a little bit. You know, it was like there was something, okay, well, something's going my way then. Football's throwing me something that's going my yeah. way. Mm. And then, and I went in and hosted, and that was the first year in the Premier League. And I got to know more of the players through talking to them, and I got to speak more to Fletch. And, and then I, I looked at the club and looked at these roles and saw this player liaison role. And it was a new role in football. It wasn't certainly wasn't there when, we, when I was there. So the, a role that you could have done with? Yeah, definitely. Definitely a role I could have done with. Aside from all the psychological work on the yeah. it's just the role of someone who could have sat you down with experience. Even someone that told me not to tear my contract up at Swindon. Yeah. You know, and, and, and said to me in actual fact, listen, Jimmy Quinn's going to get sacked within the next two months. Because <laughs> that's the reality. That's the reality. Jimmy Quinn was going to get sacked within the next two months. Why am I tearing up my two and a half year contract? Wow. Somebody within the game with experience who's yeah. been through it. Just to turn to. Just to turn mm. and give you a different perspective, one that maybe might take you out of the mindset you're in. What does the future hold for you, do you think? If, what do you want to go into? It's a good question, that one. You've got some good questions, you boys, haven't you? <laughs> You've done this before, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, do you know what? I'd, I'd like to see Bournemouth get promoted again back to the Premier League this season. I think the club, I think the club is a special club. I think what they achieved in football, I think under Eddie Howe and his team was a phenomenal feat. And I think that um, they're in a position where they should and could still be a Premier League club. Um, so, so initially, first and foremost, I'd like to see that happen. On a personal note, I don't know. I don't know what the future holds for me. Again, I was think, I've been thinking about writing a book, um, another book, and this one not so angry. This, I've had a few years to reflect from the last one. And also, I've learned a lot in the last four or five years at Bournemouth, learned more about football. I'm probably a better goalie now than I ever was as well. <laughs> <laughs> We're not bothered about what you like as a goalie. Are you still fucking scoring goals? That's what we need to know. Well, if I do it with your technique, you're standing still. <laughs> the ball come to me. <laughs> Fine, it's, the end, it's the end of the season. We'll have a staff game soon on the pitch. I'm looking forward to it. Um, I can see why managers would benefit from having you around, though. For the for the players and even for them, I think you know just speak speaking to people and it's think, obviously what you're good at. Do you know what I host? I've, I've been hosting still over the years. I carried on hosting on match days. 
for, for a period of time, I was really busy. I was hosting a lounge, running up and down the changing room, trying to sort out the problems. And then <laughs> running back up to the lounge, you go, and now we've got them, you know, running back down the stairs, trying to sort the problems out. And then you get a phone call from someone's missus, I can't find my tickets. And then I'm running up going, she can't find it. Oh no, it's the wrong, wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> I just like to welcome you. You lost your fucking ticket, bro. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's funny, but it's so true. Um, <laughs> but I can imagine, you, like, uh, uh, from obviously speaking to you the last few hours, it seems to me as though you're not worried about what the future all because of your different mindset in, in know, life now. Do you know what? When I finished football and when I'm out of football, it, 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 was, it was a bit of a burden. But, you know, I had little moments in there and even with the goal and situations have come over the years. There's a story I haven't told you that you might like. I've got, I've had a very strange relationship with, with the goal and with football and with fame to a certain degree. I hate using that word cause I don't think I'm, but, but I was, I, I come, I think it was like 2007. So it was about seven, eight years after I scored and I'm sat it's a Tuesday morning. I probably just done a, like a four day weekend. I was knackered. Kids had gone to school and there's a knock at the door. I'm living in Wimborne, a rented house. And there's a knock at the door and there's two guys outside. And they said, oh, are you Jimmy Glass? And, yeah. Oh, we're from the Daily Mirror. Can we can we come? Now, I've done lots of stuff, but no one ever turned up on your doorstep, you know? So I invited me and had a cup of tea. And they told me a story and they said that um, the previous night at a mortgage broker's dinner in, I think it was a Dorchester hotel or, or one of the top hotels, um, Steve Ryder, the, the the TV pundit who used to work for the BBC at that point, then worked for ITV. He got a bit. He was there as like an after dinner speaker. Got a bit pissed up. They couldn't find him. They eventually found him, and he sat down and started giving all the BBC's secrets away and all you know of his years at the BBC. I think they sat him, so he was a bit he was bitter. A bit bitter about it. <laughs> got pissed off. <laughs> so he's talking. And at the time, there was like some vote rigging scandals going on. Like all the TV shows were vote rigging. They were taking the votes off the public and then just doing what they wanted with it. And it was like quite a big two high at the time. And uh, and they went on to tell me that apparently Steve Ryder, who's <clears throat> giving all these secrets away about the BBC, he said that one of the biggest ones he ever saw, he said, was in 1999. So when, when Muhammad Ali won Sports Personality of the Century, I can't even say it, Sports Personality of the Century, when Jimmy Glass got more votes. No way. So I'm sat at the table, it's like nine o'clock in the morning, I'm like, just done my four day shift in my taxi. And I've got two journalists telling me that actually I've got more votes than Muhammad Ali for Sports Personality <laughs> of the Century. <laughs> 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 so basically, that was the year I scored for Carlisle. And I remember at the time there was a there was a fan thing trying to get me voted sports personality of the year. <laughs> I think at that time you voted through the Radio Times or whatever you did or yeah. you And I think what well, listen, whether Steve Ryder was just pissed at making it up, which I can't believe I can't understand why Steve Ryder would put me together in a story with Muhammad Ali. <laughs> <laughs> I never fought him. I don't know what that was about. You know? It's an unbelievable story if he did. And he must have whatever he's drinking, I'll have a pint. <laughs> and I'm sat there and I'm thinking, and this is like seven or eight years. I've now been driving a taxi for a few years. And I said I had them moments where I'm sat on a rank and um and listening to the World Cup and they mention me and I'm thinking, where's it all gone wrong? But this story, for whatever reason, this story for me, it just makes me chuckle. You know, it kind of sums up this whole this whole thing. The goal whole was an, story, yeah. it? The goal was an amazing thing, you know, and it was like a great thing. It's in 100 great sporting moments. I've loved it. I've enjoyed it. I've now found a place where I understand my career and I've enjoyed football again, Bournemouth and stuff. But I always just go back to this moment of these journalists telling me that, this story and it just makes me laugh, <laughs> you know? And I just think of all the things, you know, that, that in my life, you know, you... I actually won sports personality the same time. I'll be asking for that for 
right? Knock on the right? door. You know? Oh, Jimmy? Yeah, I, I, got, I got my uh, dad's, my late father's trophy here you for you. I'll fire it for you. <laughs> it was Muhammad Ali's daughter. Oh, all right, yeah. 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 She'd be fair, she'd beat me up, though. <laughs> so, I would try to take the trophy off her. I'd try to get it off the maid or something. I wouldn't go that easy. Anyway, listen, it's, it's, I've been lucky. The story of the goal and my career has it's had some highs and some lows. Um, but I am much happier now. I'm in a much better place. What am I going to do moving forward? I, I'm at Bournemouth. I'm, I want to see him promoted. Another year in the Premier League. My role now, since Ed's gone, has changed. I'm not so. I don't organise as much. I don't do as much now. I'm just play liaison. My job is to look after the boys, you know, which is <laughs> fine. It means I get every other weekend off. I mean, for the last six years, I've literally been everywhere and travelled everywhere, every away game, every trip, every play appearance. That's probably why I'm divorced, obviously, you know. So now it's actually I get to enjoy every other weekend, which is nice. The hosting thing I'd like to take forward, I, I'm... I only host the hospitality stuff for the football, but I, I, I do other various things, charity events and that. I'd quite like to take hosting on, maybe do more corporate hosting. I've pre I've, someone approached me about doing a podcast, so uh, watch out, fellas. I know you've done well. That's it. Not worth going into. <laughs> you've made it look very easy. <laughs> <laughs> you have to go it. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. But you know what? Eventually, you know, my kids are 20 now. My twins are 20. That they're, they're doing their own thing. They're off, you know. The, actually, my son's on holiday today. My daughter's going on Friday. So I've got more time now to think about me and do things for me. So, but uh, anyway, there you go. There's my story. Enjoyed that. Thank man. you very much, yeah. mate. Top man. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. Really enjoyed it. There we go. Jimmy Glass, sports personality of the century. <laughs> I can't, can't believe, say that. can't believe for such a quality striker you only scored one goal if I'm honest <laughs> <laughs> no cheers man cheers man brilliant. top man thank you brilliant you're welcome <laughs> I love you me them Moretti